Welcome to Kurt Vonnegut's, the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut, because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Michael Swaim. So happy to be here. Welcome. Wipe your feet on the mat and come yeah. on in. Yeah. This episode is a house. Yep. Uh, We're going to extend that metaphor <laughs> faithfully throughout the two and a half hour show. The whole time. The uh, bathroom of the house is... Why do I jump right there? <laughs> Gutter humor. Why the bathroom? Yeah, yeah. My mind uh, is the bathroom of the house. <laughs> <laughs> My comments are stored in there. And the book of this episode is Breakfast of Champions. We're doing it. God damn it. What? <laughs> <laughs> It's very open to interpretation, but my interpretation was very negative <laughs> this time through. It hit me mean? hard. Like you, oh, didn't, like you didn't enjoy the quality of the book? No, or? no, no. Just the uh, opposite, which shows my morbid curiosity with things that depress me. But in fact, I'm going to say something sacrilegious right at the top. This time through, it connected with me in a way that it didn't the first time I read it as a young person. And it's yeah. my new favorite. Like it beats Sirens of Titan, I think. Yeah. I'm tentatively saying. I had kind of the same experience. Yeah. <sighs> and when it I, hit me hard. I first read this one as a teen. It came out in 1973, so before we were born. Yeah. But I read it first as a teen, and I was like, ah, this one's super dark, and uh, I don't know, it's all right. And now I'm very much more into it. Although the copyright was renewed in 2002. You're not the only one with facts and dates. <laughs> did you find it crushingly depressing, or did you? is that how you... How did you choose to interpret it on the emotional scale? It... Is depressing, but also <laughs> there's bursts of hope in it, I think. Okay. And bursts right. of humanity toward people who otherwise don't receive humanity, I think. And, well, you uh, can gather those moments in the foyer. I'll be in the basement <laughs> showing people the horrible <laughs> truth of life. And then in the attic of happiness. Yeah. Uh, we're building a house around it. <laughs> and uh, let's get into the text of it and what happens in a segment we call Plot Time. Plot, 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 plot. You're gonna plot in time. Plot, plot. plot, 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 plot. <laughs> you barely helped me out at all there. <laughs> Just punched my card, sure, punched great. back out. Yep. You know? This book uh, has sort of a sprawling plot. One thing on this read, I felt like this book was difficult to read in this it, almost like it's kind of hard to read a poetry collection straight through or like a whole book of art straight through because there's so much all of the time like there's so much meaning sure. in each little bit that it's hard to just sit and like plow through yates or something like that you know like you want you want to kind of let each part sit with you and be a yeah thing. i think for the people who didn't read it and are still interested yeah what we're sort of talking about is it reminded me of, I mean, it's its own thing, It's and it's why we love Kurt, is he really did, I think, settle on a unique sort of voice that's unique to him yeah. and true to him. But it has something in common with the wildness of, like, beat poetry and on the road and howl and stuff. This one in particular, in the sense that instead of a crazy romp through the Holocaust or a crazy <laughs> romp to Jupiter and back, it's a crazy romp through the mind of the author themselves. It reminded me of Ken Kesey or, like, any of the mind expansion writers of this late mid to late 60s yeah. and this came out in 73 so it makes a lot of sense to me where uh, i compared it to carlin also george carlin on the facebook page just because yeah. it feels like a collection of essays and observations that are all connected and that's the thing that hit me the most this time and i really want to get into in the meet when we get there is that the first time i read it i thought all the tangents i'll just call them tangents for lack of a better word yeah. all the things where he's like now, even though the plot is about whatever, I'm going to talk about dinosaurs in a comical way as if it were a short essay that could just be like an extended Jack Handy quote about dinosaurs. <laughs> That's insightful and funny. Yeah. More insightful than Jack Handy. He didn't have a lot of wisdom to dole right. out. But yeah, there's these like psychedelic interludes all throughout. And the thing that got me the most this time is I realized, or I think, my interpretation this time was they exist for a reason, which before I thought the reason was that they're just cool observations that are true in and of themselves. But I mean, structurally, every single yeah. tangent is there for a reason. It comments on the thing that's happening in the plot, something that whew, went right over my head when I was a dumb kid. Yeah, it absolutely all fits together. I was right. about I was about to say absolutely right after you said <laughs> when I was a dumb kid, which yeah. would play like, you know, but you were a smart kid. And oh, it... Uh, you don't know that. <laughs> I just figured. I was um, on an experimental drug regimen from ages 11 to 14. <laughs> Before that, I was dumb as a post. <laughs> Until the serum you <laughs> exactly. were. Right? Yeah, this book is uh, pretty incredibly well-structured and well-put-together. 
and gets at so much meaning in such tight spaces and in such short little jumps all of the time. But between that and the perspectives, I think the book is seen from and read from between all those different things. I felt like it was some work as a reader just to like feel like I was interpreting everything. Like it's not hard to read it and understand what's happening, you know, but to feel like I was truly getting everything out of it, I felt like I was really putting in some effort because it's that good and there's that much packed in. Yeah, I felt like when I read it as a kid, it's like watching Get Out and being like, it was really scary how they were going to, you know, kill him. He had to run away. <laughs> right. You're like, you didn't get any of the shit that it connected to in life. Yeah. No, yeah. I get it. He went to a party and it was weird. Yeah. Right. That's like a film. horror movie. Right. You, it's scary. You run away. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What well, do you think the deer meant? Dead deer. <laughs> watch it. We're watching right. it again it's right now. Yeah. <laughs> it means watch where you're driving. Yeah. Uh, and also, as a reader, I feel like it's a little bit of a difficult experience. Not in a bad way. I think it is a bad way in the movie, but it's a little of a bad way uh, or a oh, not bad way. Is the movie. Oh, the movie. Uh, it was made a movie in 1999. We'll talk about it later. Oh, okay. But the book, it's coming from three perspectives throughout. It's coming from the perspective of Dwayne Hoover, who is a car dealer in Midland City, Indiana, which is loosely, clearly based on Indianapolis. It's also coming from the perspective of Kilgore Trout, an unknown science fiction writer who you know about if you've read some other Vonnegut books. And then the Friend third of the show. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then it also comes from Kurt himself. He will write himself into the story and show up. But it, it's coming from a car dealer who is going insane, a uh, science fiction writer who is kind of insane and definitely grumpy all I the time. I wouldn't say insane at all. Well, yeah. That's yeah. A matter insane for is a bad word for He's it. He's totally a misfit of what society expects of you. Yeah, but stressed, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah. You can always follow his train of thought. It's very like wry and crotchety, but he's never yes. detached from reality. Yeah, that's true. What he wants to do is insane in the sense that it's like, what are you trying to prove, man? We'll get there. <laughs> and but, I just want to say, it's not like Poisonwood Bible, great book, Barbara King Solver, in the sense mm -hmm. that it's not like written from the varying perspectives. Or, and I know you don't mean to apply that. Yeah. And one of the that's things I think point, is most though. interesting about it is. It's a book where I think one of the major themes is Kurt as someone in their 50s and who's arrived at the conclusion that meditation is something valuable, is trying to renew himself and clear his mind and approach things afresh. Yeah. And as part of that exercise, I think in this Bible, which I am going to now, like I, I, Sirens <laughs> has been displaced. This is my new Bible. <laughs> Except for all the racist parts. He's, yeah. uh, <laughs> I guess, the Bible, too. Ooh, different podcast. Ooh, yikes. But he writes very much from a position of, like, and this is one of my favorite things to do, an alien or a person who just fell to Earth with no knowledge or a baby. Yeah. Like, he describes constantly throughout stuff from a completely alien perspective. He describes masturbation to you in medical terms as if, like, you didn't, or getting an erection. Yeah. As if you didn't understand how it worked. Because... This is what I arrived at. He arrives at new wisdoms by clearing out all of his preconceived notions and approaching things new, new, blank slate, new. And there's a lot of stuff, I don't, and I'm a new agey guy, so maybe this is just what I got from it. But there's, to me, there was a lot about clearing your mind and entering the void, so to speak. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, and, and directly and from yeah. him and the preface. And, so he's always yeah. talking as himself, third person, omniscient, super omniscient, yeah. as Kurt likes to be, where he like straight up tells you the future ruins surprises <laughs> says yeah. like three chapters from now this is going to happen get and that, off my back <laughs> when that and that alien perspective is really dominant in it and even even probably more so than the actual story is him being his point a, of view being, yeah and i think even the racial elements are often more alien than racist it's just, it's it's more oh just people were different colors and this happened to them because of it i get and that in my yeah, yeah certainly vana what is going to be more nuanced this time yeah because you can't just go like, because he drops the N-word left and right, like he's in Django territory here. <laughs> and you can't just go, oh, well, it's a racist book then. So we'll have to like right. tackle the nuance of whether he was being responsible with all those depictions. We'll get to that too. Yeah, we will. we're clearly both very excited about it's this book. It's a plot time! And it's, there's a lot going on. I with will this. say this, for the first time I wrote like crib notes of the plot because it was simple enough. Yeah, it's only it, like a paragraph if you just literally say the things that happen without yeah. what Kurt Vonnegut says about it in commentary. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, the actual events of it are, well, it, the way it sets up is there's 
the title of the book on the cover. Then there's yeah. a doodle based subtitle immediately. And then 10 minutes in, we're getting to the cover. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it. And this book is very art driven. There's just doodles throughout all the time, along with tangents and everything else. Actual plot wise, there's a very important Kurt preface where he talks about his time in Indianapolis as a kid. He dedicates the book to a woman named Phoebe Hurdy. He says it's in memory of Phoebe Hurdy who comforted me in Indianapolis during the Great Depression and then talks about her being someone who spoke to him and his friends in a frank way and in a ribald way and in a fun way and that influenced him for the rest of his life. And then he talks about what, Michael, you were saying, where he directly tells you, I'm turning 50. There's a lot of things that have been put in my head that I don't necessarily believe. I'm trying to clear them out. I'm trying to renew. I'm trying to become whole again as I write this crazy, crazy book. And then he does a drawing of a hole. <laughs> Throughout. And then at the end of the preface, he does a really beautiful, I call it a speech about Armistice Day and his birthday, because he was born November 11th, which is Armistice Day, which is mm -hmm. Veterans Day. And then he gets straight into the story and calls it a meeting of two lonesome no, skinny... What, what? Before that, sorry, because I love how we, <laughs> we always spend a little time on everything that comes before the story. Yeah. Before even the preface, there's the alternate title and the doodle, which I think are meaningful. It's called Breakfast of Champions or Goodbye yeah, Blue Monday. I vaguely mentioned that, but that's good to call so, it out specifically. Oh, right. yeah. well, don't be vague, because <laughs> I have a joke to say, which is that I just think, or at least an observation, a wry observation. Oh, here we I go. I think it's awesome that this alternate title page, which is a picture, a doodle of a cow with a word balloon that says Goodbye Blue Monday, after you've read the book, it's a book you have to read twice, because now looking at it now for yeah. a second time, I realized this is a cow that I can assume is about to be or has been fucked by Shepherdstown inmates yes. before the milk was trucked away, saying a slogan of a washing machine, the brain of which was used to drop bombs in World War yeah. II. It's freaking labyrinthine and arrested development -y in its interconnectedness to the point where, and I think this is one of the big themes of the book too, he says, one of my favorite lines, or the thing that like revealed the meaning of the book to me was, symbols can be so beautiful sometimes. And uh, I think all throughout, he layers in so many symbols and connects them to so many things that you get this incredibly enriched experience of like, all everything means everything. Now when I look at yeah. any doodle in the book, it connects to eight different people's life stories, which is Yeah, awesome. right. And they're often not even dressed up beyond what they are. Like, he'll just say, this is what a football looked like, and it's a picture of a football. But yeah, exactly. there's a lot too, you know, it's like going on. And yeah, and if you haven't read the book before, there are all those threads will connect to the cow drawn at the beginning, and <laughs> right. it'll make sense. <laughs> that's what I think is interesting is by the end of the podcast, you'll understand all those things. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. And so he, uh, at the very beginning of the story says, quote, this is a tale of a meeting of two lonesome, skinny, fairly old white men on a planet which was dying fast. And then he sets up for you that we're going to have Dwayne Hoover, the losing his mind car dealer, meet Kilgore Trout, the grouchy, unheard of science fiction writer who is living in New York at the start of it. They're going to collide, and that's going to be the thing we're building to for the whole book. The first scene we get is basically the MacGuffin that gets Trout on his way to Midland City, where Dwayne already is, because that's where he lives and works, which is Fred T. Berry, a bigwig in Midland City, is fabulously well-to-do is sponsoring an arts festival there to sort of put the town on the map, make it more respectable. And that arts festival has obtained a lot of funding from Elliot Rosewater, friend of the show. <laughs> and as we know, well, some of the stuff isn't true to the Vonnegut canon, as we've said again and again. Yeah, but one thing it, that is, is in this universe, Rosewater is indeed still the one and only and ultimate fan of Kilgore Trout. Yeah. So he says, I'll only that is consistent. Yeah. pay for the festival if Kilgore Trout is a keynote speaker because he's the greatest writer ever and he'll win the Nobel Prize and he should be president. Yeah. And they're like, fine, for the money, fine. Because <laughs> if, if you're super new to the show, Kurt Vonnegut has a lot of recurring characters. Mm -hmm. And if you're less new to the show, you may not know that those recurring characters will often not have any continuity between themselves. Yeah, so exactly. it is it is important that he's continuing the thing where Elliot Rosewater, kind of drifting, lost billionaire, is the biggest fan of Kilgore Trout yes. and moving him around the world because he's the one person who loves his writing. Right. And Trout, for his part, gets the letter and is like, this is bullshit. 
but then quickly decides because he's so fucking crotchety yeah that he'll go because he resents that they think artists find truth and beauty and he's like i spent my whole life trying to find truth and beauty and i'm a broken down failure old man who hates everything yeah i'm gonna go there and give him a <laughs> keynote speech where i call them all bastards and show them that they're assholes or whatever yeah. he just has like a vague notion of ruining their day and showing them <laughs> how horrible his life is and being like it's your fault yeah well, <laughs> Because also he makes this decision in his like basement apartment in New York City, which Kurt mostly depicts as a nightmare, the whole city. And he also decides this in a conversation with his pet parakeet. So the parakeet's no. just there. And he also, his main actual job is selling aluminum screen windows and storm windows rather than actually writing. And then his writing... Very popular Vonnegut job. Yeah, incredibly <laughs> popular across the short stories, that specific job. And his writing is also published by a company called World Classics Library of Los Angeles, California, which is a porn company. They just make... Friend of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Publisher of the show? No. Yeah. They just make books with pictures of wide open beavers in them, as Kurt calls it. But they need some like text to fill them out. And so they use Kilgore Trout stories. Often don't even tell him that they've published them and he just finds out later because it's just pure filler for them. But he's the one guy who's like, oh my God, I've written for these people. Amazing. And he's self-loathing, so he throws the shit away. So, like, he doesn't even have copies of his own stories. Yeah. <laughs> so he just, he's like, some amount of my stories have been published in porno magazines because I found out by chance that that's true. But otherwise, he's shocked anyone has ever found him or heard of him or he has a fan. Yeah. And he doesn't think they should be a fan. He thinks they're dumb assholes for <laughs> right. sending him a fan letter. So he's yeah. going to go there to tell them, fuck you for this fan letter. <laughs> yeah, it's like that Groucho Marx perspective of a club that would have yeah. him as a member. Nothing. I'd like to join a club and hit you over the head with it. <laughs> he had a lot of club jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and so as we meet him, we also meet Dwayne Hoover. Dwayne and Hoover. And Dwayne Hoover is Midland City's biggest and most trusted car dealer. He sells Pontiacs. And he also lives alone. His wife killed herself by drinking Drano. And Kurt tells us right up front that chemicals are going poorly inside of Dwayne and he's losing his mind. He has bad chemicals. Yeah. And he will throughout the novel describe a lot of people and also just people in general as being chemical driven and being machines, at least to the extent that they're a bag of chemicals doing this and that inside and whatever happens will happen. One of the most important themes of the book is that Kurt in his lifetime has observed that people most of the time behave either the same way a machine would function based on like stimulus input or like a beaker full of chemicals whereby the imbalance of chemicals in one direction or another sort of dictates your emotional state. And he doesn't seem to definitively say if there is or isn't free will or, but it's certainly one of the main like five things we're pondering Yeah, is People are certainly robots to some extent. Is that bad? To what extent? <laughs> Is it 100%? Are they only robots? Yeah. If they're not, what's the filler? <laughs> yeah, and one, and one of the most interesting things to me about this book is I feel like later Kurt will at least partly reject that because la later on he'll say that everyone is an unwavering beam of light and meaningful and you know and also uh, more than just that sack of chemicals. And he says thing. it allows him to renew himself and he seems to be genuine when he says that, yeah. Yeah. But then the ending. Anyway, <laughs> Dwayne has all these local commercials. His slogan is, remember, you can trust Dwayne. Or everyone says, you can trust Dwayne. Yeah. He's, it is, it's, he's a local fixture. And it's like a slightly unbelievable thing where apparently in this Indianapolis-type town, a car dealer is the most popular like dude and celebrity. kind of a folk hero. Yeah, for no reason. But I have lived occasionally in places where there is a car dealer whose commercials are so crazy and endearing that they are kind of a local well, celebrity like this. everyone who grew up in San Diego County knows Go See Cal, Go See Cal, Go See Cal. And like his yeah. specific way he shot his commercials, and he always had a different animal called Spot that he called his dog Spot. Oh, there you go. But... If you saw him in a restaurant, <laughs> there's a 10% chance you'd recognize him right. and a 0.004% chance you'd go over and be like, we love your cars, please <laughs> sign my tits. Like people flip out when Dwayne comes anywhere in their area consistently right. throughout the book, which is whatever. Yeah, which which would be untrue of Bob <laughs> Rohrman in the Chicagoland region yeah, with exactly. his Bob Rohrman ads yeah. <laughs> and also Billy Fusillo in Syracuse, New York. I don't know that that would happen with either of them. But yeah. you'd know who they are. You'd exactly. be like, oh, yeah, it's Depends Billy Fusilla. Depends how small and shitty your town is, I guess. <laughs> Dwayne, well, the author, authorial voice mentions in passing that Dwayne had a rough weekend. He attempted, or he stuck a gun in his mouth thinking he'd shoot himself. Instead, he shot his 
flamingo engraved glass shower door. Yeah. And no one heard him because the walls of their McMansions are so well insulated. So your little depiction of like suburban mundane hell. We've seen that in lots of good movies and yeah, works of literature. It's been a thing. Yeah. He's living his own American beauty situation. <laughs> yeah. Because he's he's living alone except for his housekeeper. Already said his wife committed suicide by drinking Drano. He has one child who's his son George, who goes by the nickname Bunny. And is basically yeah. estranged, but also lives in town estranged and plays piano at the hotel. Estranged just because he's gay, which is Dwayne's fucking bad. Right, dude. it's his own mistake and <laughs> problem, and he shouldn't have done that. And uh, uh, yeah, but I love that even though he's completely insulated from the world to the point of depressing numbness, yeah, he's driving around a car that's not a Pontiac after he's going to kill himself, right? Because he is testing it out because it's a competitor's car. Right. And as he pulls out of his driveway, because he still feels the <laughs> pressure of society's eye upon him, he honks a couple times and yells, just testing out the competition, because right, right. he's worried <laughs> that the people who didn't give a shit that he tried to kill himself would judge him for not driving a Pontiac. Yeah. Like, it's a weird dichotomy of he lives constantly under the gaze of society, but still feels totally alone. In a nutshell, very well done. Yeah, yeah. Which is one of the funniest parts of the book to me, that he's just yelling out his car, yeah. like, I'm just I'm just testing up. Like, yeah. after this horribly dark scene. Like, it would scene. be a scandal if, he, if they're like, he was driving a Prius, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. And also, no lie, this book does have some darkness to it. Like, oh, this is yeah. a book where one of the main characters puts a gun in his mouth and changes his mind about because it. Because his wife his recently door. drank Drano. It's yeah. not, it's dark. And that all <laughs> happens about 15% of the way through. Yeah. So it's not like you've been set up for this or built up to it. It's out of nowhere, which I think is really effective as a shock and as a piece of writing. But also, yeah. it's dark. It's, it's, how, it's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. So after he pulls out, he goes driving around, but I have to jump back because Kurt sort of disjoints time. But the one thing that happened before that, and I'm on top of it because I made notes this time, hey. is uh, he, he has this brief scene where right before he goes home and puts the gun in his mouth, he is at work at the dealership and his main dude, his right-hand guy, Harry yeah. LeSabre, is there. And he basically, because of his bad chemicals, snaps at Harry for being a shitty dresser. Like he goes, you should burn all your clothes and get a new wardrobe. Yeah. You depressing piece of shit because he wears conservative suits. Harry freaks out because he thinks it's code for Dwayne saying, I know that you're secretly a transvestite, which he is. He's secretly a transvestite. His wife knows and doesn't care. They're very liberated, but no one knows. Right. And Only when Dwayne out of the blue is like, I know about your clothes, man. You need a new wardrobe. You understand what I'm saying? He's right. like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and even in spite of his bad chemicals, Dwayne just means we're doing a Hawaiian week promotion at the dealership. That's why you need to dress a little brighter. Like, he doesn't mean I know all of your secrets about this right. thing. He just means we're doing a themed Hawaiian thing and you yeah. should be and a Yeah, and Vonnie makes it clear that he doesn't even <laughs> mean it. Right. In the sense that he doesn't care that much, but he needed someone to yell at in that moment because of his bad chemicals. So he did it. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. still like and close and he's not mad at him. But, but it's weird. a great point that we all know, which is like, yeah, his bad chemicals make him lash out at this guy. And there's these elaborate repercussions that he can never imagine would have unfolded. Yeah, yeah. Not that he would have cared if it, that he did because he's kind of an asshole. But yeah, you never know what effect you're going to have on someone. So but anyway, yeah. he's going to kill himself. He doesn't. He's driving around. He sort of just uh, Officer McNulty's it. He just like drunk drives off the road and skids into a vacant lot. Right. And then he realizes he owns the lot because he owns a lot of land in the area. Yeah. So he's like, oh, I guess I'm allowed to just sit here. And he listens to advertisements on the radio, which it's a great moment, which lull him to sleep like a lullaby because it's the most American thing you can listen to is someone buying or selling some damn thing, as Kurt Vonnegut says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he just pleasantly enjoys all of it in the town he owns most of <laughs> yeah. while he goes insane. And then meanwhile, we've got Kilgore Trout working his way to Midland City. He goes into another part of New York City to try to find copies of his own work. And he goes in into porno a, stores, as we said. Yeah, yeah, in a porno store. There's, I think, a really funny joke when he picks up. They keep all the good porn in the back of the store, Kurt says. And so the front just has the junk that has Kilgore Trout's words in it because it's yeah. the like ostensible normal books. And so he buys one and immediately tells the cashier, it's for an arts festival. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's true, right. but really funny to me. 
And so he does that and then also wanders his way into a blue movie. And uh, throughout this book, Kilgore Trout is either thinking of new short stories or you're being told about existing stories by Trout. So whenever you're with, with Trout, short stories. yeah, whenever you're with Trout, it's like Illustrated Man. If, yeah. if each story was a paragraph long, it's awesome. Like right. you hear elevator pitches for a dozen short stories that all have good sci-fi hooks, or most of them would be good. Yeah, which <laughs> is part stories. of why it felt like, oh, my brain's really working to digest all this, because there's also like a short story collection and a half built into the novel. Yeah, and each <laughs> short awesome. story has a moral that you have to decode by reading into the symbolism, even though yeah. you only get a couple paragraphs of the yeah. details of the story. And that's a recurring theme of the book, which Kurt calls out at the end, which is that... And man, it's another thing I love about this book, is I feel like it's the one that totally crystallized to me why Kurt's voice is the way it is. And I don't want to get into all of that immediately, but the one that I have to call out yeah, now is yeah. one of the reasons he has that unique way of being like, he never dwells on like, and I do in my writing, I love it, like the azure of the sky compared to a lilac, that it, blah, blah, blah. Right. Any details. He just goes, this happens, this happens, this happens. He's okay with the turn of phrase that is clever, but he does not care about, he's like, you know this story is not real. Who cares if I like right. vividly paint the fake room everyone knows is fake? You're just trying to figure out what I'm trying to communicate to you. Boom. That's why he ends up writing like a playwriter, like so sparely. And at the end, he explicitly says that. And I just think that's so boiled down to like, he's not even going to write a six page short story. He'll be like, you want a short story? There's a planet where there's so much art because they were so good at preserving art that they start spinning a lottery wheel to decide which art is the Mona Lisa and which art to burn and throw away. Get it? Social commentary, twist, hook, done. I'm not going to, like, describe it to you. Right. I don't need to. You've yeah. got stuff to do. So do I. Right. This is the idea. He doesn't care it. about making the fake people he made up seem real. Like, he just uses right. them as to convey his point, and he is done <laughs> yeah and that's like almost harder to write i think like it's oh, all you have it's, to have or way maybe more shit even to say. harder to write like yeah. you really have to this book is freighted with meaning and so spare and to make that and, and to put that together as a writer you have to do an incredible job yeah like, i think and people have said before that i think he gets mistaken for being not as good at writing as he is because it's right. just simple and to the point and gets to it. And I love it as a craft and I have nothing against it, but I think people who relish the written word in and of itself and are like, I do like a long paragraph with a beautiful writing that makes me think of pretty images Yeah, because that's part of living this life and experiencing. I also am like, yeah, I like that too. But this is valid too, where he's just yes. like, I don't need that. That's cool too. It takes all kinds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were telling us about the porno theater you love to visit in your mind <laughs> when you're here. Trout goes through that. I think runs across prostitutes. I think it's yep. robbed. Rebuffs them uh, and gets mugged. Yeah. And ba New York is hell in this book. Yes. It's not a good place to be at all. But that's not Kurt's point, I think. It's just how he depicts it and how he depicts Trout's experience of it. Right. Yeah. Trout gets mugged and they make a really, he makes a really good little microcosm of like fake news or the damage of memes, which is a recurring theme also, especially because one of the doodles has, or I can't remember, but one of the phrases he hammers home in the book is, we're only as humane as our ideas are. Yeah, it's on Trout's epitaph early on. He gives yeah. you a preview of Trout dies in 1981, and this is what he'll be buried with. Exactly, yeah. So that is shown to be true throughout and the danger of spreading false information and how it can act like a disease. So basically, Trout is very verbose much like myself. And when he's at the hospital, when he's at the police station being questioned, they're like, did you see the perps? And he's like, for all I know, they may as well have been a, an intelligent gas from Pluto. He does. Right. He doesn't have a British accent, but, <laughs> and, but that's like such a turn of phrase that they just take him literally. They're like, okay, Pluto gang, got it. And they start disseminating right. APBs for the Pluto gang. <laughs> and he talks about how in the coming months, People started not sending their kids out at night for fear of the Pluto gang. And yeah. there was a local gang that was like, we could take on the Pluto gang. We're going to call ourselves a Pluto gang and take on the Pluto gang and become the official Pluto gang. So then there came into existence a real Pluto gang. Yeah. It's like horrible robbers. How right. after Breaking Bad, literally meth died blue, which had never existed before, started showing up left and right at meth labs. Yeah. Yeah. It's the popularity of bad information. <laughs> <laughs> 
Or even, or even like that theory that there was no one Jack the Ripper and just like one murder happened and there were copycats, you know? It's like that. Oh, like that's how, an extreme version. Totally. But yeah. I didn't know that theory, but it makes sense. Yeah. Like how the Bermuda Triangle, they're like, uh, if you crunch the numbers, statistically, it's such a large area. The number of planes and ships that have disappeared in oh. it is statistically insignificant. Like it's right, normal. Right, it's just normal. If it's you picked any ocean. triangle that size in the ocean, that many planes have crashed in it. Right. <laughs> I've never been it's heard. It's just how it works, yeah, but we notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> People like triangles. So back yeah. to Dwayne. Yeah, yeah. Dwayne is uh, basically sitting in his car in the lot still. We cut to the hospital where we meet Cyprian Uquende. Is that yes. how you pronounce it? That was how I did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Who is an Indaro man who's a doctor in the town, an yeah. immigrant. And also, I tried to Google. He says he's from Nigeria and from the Indaro tribe. I don't know if that's a real tribe. Really? I couldn't. Just made it up? Uh, okay. The main Google result was this book. I don't. I don't think it's actually a thing. Well, he's but watching he's, yeah. this woman named Mary Young die in the hospital. She used to know and like be Dwayne's part-time nanny when he was very young. Yeah. So this is a weird thing, but it mimics the structure of the book. It's very tangential. When she dies, she sends out a psychic tendril that affects anyone who knew her in life, which Vonnegut says how everyone does in right. this universe. So Dwayne wakes up because he she died. So he wakes up with this feeling a little better, I guess it's what I sort of felt was implied. And yeah. decides that what would really help his bad chemicals go away is to go spend a night at a hotel instead of at his house because his house is too depressing. Right. It reminds him of his wife's death and all his mistakes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So he goes to the Holiday Inn, which he also owns, (laughs) and gets in line, and he happens to be right behind Cyprian Uquende, who was up late because he was watching a woman die. And I don't know what this means. I want to talk about it later. But we just take the time for Dwayne to feel racist towards Cyprian. (laughs) Yeah. And then check into his hotel. It's just a tangent. And I think Vonnegut is just trying to depict the world as it is. And certainly racism is, unchecked racism is something he's trying to showcase. I think so, yeah. So this is this normal middle class white guy who gets in line behind a black guy. And of course, he's not, or at least not of course, but it's good that he's not overtly racist. But we take the time to go into his mind and have him be like uneasy that a black dude is sleeping, that he's sleeping in the same hotel a black person would sleep in. And he yeah. just goes, oh, well, times change, times change. And you're I like, thought, oh, I guess that's okay then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least he kept it to himself. <laughs> when I, and I also thought, because Kurt talks a lot about African-Americans in this book, and I, I thought Cyprian in general was an attempt by Kurt, successful or failed, I don't know, to try to talk about the difference between African-Americans and other people who are black. Sure, like, because yeah. Cyprian is an African-African, so to speak. And who is a recent immigrant, so he hasn't been worked on by the same system, the exact same system, not that he doesn't face his own unique challenges in life, but the same system that's uniquely at work on African Americans who whose ancestors were American slaves and all that. Right, right. Right. And so I think and I think it was partly trying to just point to some kind of even racists have no idea what's going on at all. Like, right, sure. <laughs> like yeah, Dwayne, yeah, yeah. even what Dwayne thinks he's thinking is happening is not even happening. Although he also does. Also, it d- wouldn't <laughs> be a thing anyway, so it's fine. Like, it's, yeah. it's not a, yeah. Although he also, I should save this for Vanawa, but he also ducks into Cyprian's mind just long enough to tell us that only two thoughts fill his head. He right. misses his huge family of like 600 people back home. Yeah, yeah. And he wishes he could fuck like 40 times a day because he's so horny all the time. <laughs> both of which I would call problematic stereotypes. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, I feel like both of those are... are we don't have big, to move on if the, you have something to say. I feel say, like both yeah. of those are big tropes for Kurt, like especially when we get into slapstick in the future and some other things like extended family is a big thing for him yes. and how other cultures do that. And then also just men wanting to fuck everything all the and time yes. is kind of, kind of true of a lot of he's Kurt's n- males. You know? He's not the only man depicted as wanting to fuck all the time. But I he, could go through and show you all the parts of my book that are highlighted <laughs> where he uses adjectives you use to describe an animal to describe... Yeah black people being horny and he doesn't do that with the white characters oh, that's and I do great. think there's something there that's just yeah. subconscious I, I think yeah, I you can that. very yeah. consciously be fighting racism and still in your words just belie that well you're working on it you're not right, all right. the way there yet <laughs> we will get there yeah, yeah. Just uh, want to say, well, just because Kurt spent so much time on it, it seems important to him. Three pages is a long time in Kurt time. Yeah, it is. <laughs> on how amazingly comforting it is to be in a hotel room because it's like a womb-like envelope made just for you yeah. as if you are a baby and didn't exist before. It doesn't judge you for any of your past sins. Your past is not apparent anywhere in the room. Yeah. So he sleeps like a lamb and he wakes up thinking, deludedly, that 
his suicidal ideations are completely cured. Like, oh, I just needed a good night's sleep, he tells himself. Right. Yeah. Which is also kind of an interesting, like, tack on commercialism. Like, oh, one night in a hotel will make you not suicidal <laughs> if you swing by our hotel. Yeah, goodbye, Blue Monday. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> okay, but then we cut back to Trout as he journeys to Mordor. Yeah, and he's truck riding into Philly. and Hitchhiking with a series of truckers. Yeah, he'll meet a couple different truckers, I think all of whom he has bad experiences with, or at least weird interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's gas, grass, or ass, and he doesn't have gas or grass. So <laughs> it gets weird. Yeah. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Why do you think all the <laughs> asshole drawings are in there? But anyway. We also we find out the trout can only m remember the looks of really, really odd looking people. That's and so other true Otherwise, me, he yeah. kind of has face blindness. And then Kurt says that he, Kurt, also has that with people. Like so he can only really remember that. really yeah. strange looking people. Like he says, Kilgore looked away. Or he says like a hundred times a, an hour, he forgot the driver's name. When he looked away, he forgot what his face looked like too until he looked back. And the truck driver was like, Kilgore, right? <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> damn it. When you are not trying to be rude, but you just don't have that ability to remember people and they do, you're like, damn it. Dude. Yeah. It's, like, I uh, mean, Matt? Like just yeah. every time. This yeah. is one of the rare books that could be adapted into a stand-up special easily. Does that oh. make sense? <laughs> like, no, a lot of the You could cut out yeah. all the storytelling, yeah. but I'm saying there are enough observations to fill a 45 minute stand up special with yeah, solid sure. stand up observations. Like yeah, yeah. the clever description of like forgetting someone's face and name yeah. literally every time your eyes like look away. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good bit. Yeah. Yeah. Even the, the some of the drawings could be Dimitri Martin type segments. Oh, you know? totally. And, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so there's a series. We're going to cut back and forth. But every time we cut back to Trout for a while, he's hitchhiking with different people. And yeah. as Alex said, throughout that whole process, every time we cut back to him, he's basically a framing device for we hear short stories of his yeah. and we have him chat with the truckers and that itself is a short story if you know what I mean like right. when he chats with the trucker you could just cut that out and make it an O. Henry story about whatever the topic is so it's just vignettes 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 of really meaningful observations yeah. many of which we will get into but you can't <laughs> there's not time for all of them right. unless we just read the book to you <laughs> <laughs> so he's just like spouting wisdom sometimes he agrees with the truck driver sometimes the truck driver drops the wisdom sometimes Sometimes Trout drops the wisdom. Sometimes Trout's like, wow, good point. I didn't think of that, truck driver. Uh, yeah. It's even-handed. And a lot of the time, Trout is either thinking about or saying the plot of one of his short stories out loud, to which usually whoever he's driving with goes like, that sounds dumb. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's a recurring joke. No one gives a shit about sci-fi. Yeah. And I think, I think in one case, the truck driver's talking about this book he loves, and it's one of Trout's. Like it's and, of, yeah. again... There's so many vignettes that have so much meaning that you can't get to them Right, all. we won't, yeah. Yeah, but that one's amazing. It's over and over, and they're all packed together. Like, some of them are through lines, and some of them are one-offs. It's great. Yeah. But there's a through line of Trout wishing anyone would know one of the stories he mentions, and then a truck driver does, and he's too embarrassed to say that he wrote it. And that, right. that means so much, too. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and we have this back and forth between his experiences in trucks and then also Dwayne mainly being at the car dealership and falling apart mentally and also dealing with all sorts of various people in his life he's dealing with Francine Pefko who is a widow just like Dwayne is and then they've struck up a relationship since then her husband was killed in Vietnam uh, and now she's the secretary but really the person doing the day-to-day -day running of Dwayne's dealership yep. Harry shows up to work in Wilder Clothes for Hawaiian Week Dwayne is not altogether there mentally and so he just kind of brushes past him and so then harry decides oh he really does know i'm a transvestite he I guess. thinks that's the last nail in the coffin and yeah. he contemplates like fleeing town that night changing right. his net like he doesn't know what to do next yeah he and his wife have a pipe dream about moving to hawaii and he's right. like i guess we pull the trigger now well, i guess we just do it and they are the only people that get a happy ending at all and i think that is yeah, a powerful much. statement yeah is kurt just says the end of their story the last you'll ever hear from them is and so they did yeah. Like, she finally goes, like, Grace is the voice Maui. of wisdom. Let's do it. You have enough money. You're putting yourself willingly under the gaze of someone that you're worried will hate you, but you don't care and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Why don't we just leave? And so they did. And yeah. you're like, oh, good. That's nice for them. Good for and we'll never hear from them again. Please. On that same day, and of course, it should be noted, he only didn't talk to Harry because he's like, in the depths of tripping balls because of his madness. Right. <laughs> he like, you know, he had, he he's had, in like, he's just seeing shimmery lights and shit. So he right. just like nervously goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, and goes in his office. And Harry's like, oh, fuck. 
Yeah, Kurt <laughs> describes him as like that night he saw eleven moons. The next morning he saw a duck directing traffic. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, exactly. he's completely lost his mind. Looney Tunes, as they say, as Kurt would probably say. Yeah. So we've introduced and extraduced, not a word, friend of the show, Harry LeSaber <laughs> and uh, Francine Pefko. We'll get into yeah. her arc at the same time. We also introduce another of the constellation of people that Dwayne will fuck over, <laughs> Wayne Hubler. Right. Not to be confused with Dwayne Hoover. Yeah who is a recent parolee of Shepherdstown Correctional Institute, the big prison in the city. Kurt, of course, makes the point that it's mostly black people and yeah. does a very alien like the white people, the people with white skin like to put the people with black skin in the jail. It made them feel better. Like, right, he does kind of a very yeah. dry assessment of racial strife. Yeah, and of the history of slavery and yes. earlier in the book, The Settlement of America. Exactly. Oh, well, that's the opening thing, and it's yeah. one of the best, like, opening rants ever, yeah. But Wayne Hubler's only reason to exist, as far as the novel is concerned, is uh, he's deeply uneducated, doesn't understand much about the world, but when he was in prison, he kept to himself. He had secret dreams of, and this really touched me, man, because I know exactly what he means. He had secret dreams of just the vague idea of a place where things would be nice. Or yeah. Kurt at one point compares the situation to a dog he knew in real life that was a giant greyhound that his friend kept since birth in like a penthouse New York apartment. And he's like, the dog, much like Wayne Hubler, must have at some point, even though they were never given the materials to understand how unfair their life was, they must have felt like some huge mistake had been made. Yeah. yeah. And that really <laughs> hits me hard. And that is certainly how Wayne Hubler feels. And he vaguely aches for the feeling of fairness and a place where he would feel safe and loved. And in his yeah. mind, he calls that fairyland. And he knows enough to know that he's never supposed to say that out loud because right. people will just laugh or beat the shit out of you. But he <laughs> harbors the secret dream, and he thinks the way to get to fairyland is that he's destined to work at Dwayne Hoover's car dealership because every night in prison he saw a bunch of commercials that said you can trust Dwayne Hoover. And yeah. he was like, get it? Wayne Hoobler? Dwayne Hoover? Right. Thank Universe. you for the sign, God. Yeah, it all makes Finally, sense. Finally, I will be cut a break. So, like, for years, he's assumed that he's going to meet Wayne Hoover and tell him his name is similar, and Wayne Hoover will be like, I like the cut of your jib, kid. Right. And, like, everything will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then instead, every time he meets Dwayne in the book, Dwayne is losing his mind and doesn't help him at all. Like, he pawns him off on Harry at one point. He just yeah. doesn't. Even though there's times him. he's lucid through sheer horrible chance, as Kurt likes to do, yeah. he only runs into Dwayne when Dwayne is in a really bad state. Yeah. So, Dwayne always just, like, vaguely shakes his head no at him and like waves him off <laughs> and so he basically becomes a vagrant for the couple of days that the book takes place meaning he refuses yeah. to leave the lot right. he like hides by the dumpster and wanders and walks around the block he just won't leave the car lot yeah and just tries to seem like he belongs there for some reason but really doesn't there's also kurt briefly mentions that Dwayne hoover's ancestors were named hubler but they changed the name upon arriving in Midland City's area because too many black people had the name yes. Hubler. So they even had the same and last name in history. And they don't say black people, but they never if you say. get my drift. <laughs> and along no, that don't. thread, the connections, and I think that's there intentionally to show how deeply fucked up it is to think that they're different when like their histories and lives and blood is so intermingled and it's yeah. so arbitrary. The very farm that like, one of the few things that one of the black people has pride in is they know all their ancestors. This is near the end of the book. It's the ambulance driver. Yeah. And his aunt, one of his ancestors, he knows for a fact, used to own a lot of land in this town. And they owned the nicest farm at the time, which was called Bluebird Farm. And we find out Bluebird Farm is where... Dwayne's stepdad originally got his money based on a lawsuit. He was awarded the farm. He changed the name to some other farm. But it's where Sacred Miracle Cave is, which we'll get to. We haven't even gotten to that. Yeah. But the point is, it's where Dwayne got his money to begin with and start his whole empire. And when they got there and it was called Bluebird Farm, the stepdad threw the sign in the dirt and was like, they gave me a goddamn N-word farm. So you're like... Okay. It's the same farm that this other family loved, and it's like the thing they're most proud of. Everything right. is meaningless. Like, you just arbitrarily decide. And I think that's a big point of the book. Symbols can mean whatever you put into them. So can life. So can this patch of land. Yeah. Like, this one family got so much joy out of owning this patch of land. This guy who's been given all the breaks hates it. Well... That's how it goes sometimes. Like, it's what you get out of it, you know? Yeah. Because there's also, you mentioned Sacred Miracle Cave. Around this point, we meet. Yeah, well, uh, this is where it happens. Good. Lyle and Kyle 
Hoover, who are uh, the stepbrothers of Dwayne, and who run Sacred Miracle Cave, which is a tourist trap they set up. It was just a cave, and they have it's built the a farm. mythology it. around yeah. it, where it's a thing you need to go see. There's signage all around town saying, visit Sacred Miracle Cave, and you're this far away, which is very common of tourist traps, having a sign like every couple of miles leading up to it. Yep. And it's also being filled with pollution, because Barrytron has a factory that they gave the job of dealing with the pollution for to a mob-controlled company that's just dumping it in a creek in town called Trigger Creek, and then that's polluting the cave, and so it's all gross and, and full he'll of make weird the, pollution. He makes the very poignant tangent that the system is set up in such a way that everyone's insulated enough that no one has to feel bad about the earth being destroyed because the Maritimo brothers, or Maritimo or Maritimo, I dare you. To I'd say Maritimo. You. I said Maritimo. The Maritimo <laughs> in my head, I mean. The crime family is polluting the river. Yeah. They don't feel bad because they've faced so many troubles in their lives that they're at a point where they identify themselves as the criminal class and they've justified that they can do this. Yeah. Barry Tron doesn't feel bad because even though they would be horrified to find out that they're polluting, when they do find out, they're like, oh, we legitimately didn't know. We are ashamed. We're sorry. No harm, no foul, right? Like, we yeah. didn't know those guys were gangsters. We didn't know they were going to do that. So there's a handy setup where everyone can fuck the earth and no one feels bad about <laughs> it. And that's why we're all going to die someday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so that pollution is now poisoning the water in the cave, right? Yeah. The groundwater. And so this problem is being brought to Dwayne. Other problems are being brought to Dwayne. And eventually he says, hey, Francine, we've been a couple for a long time. Let's leave the dealership now go to a hotel and have sex. I need to relax. She's like, right. oh, I guess I can find someone to cover my desk and running the dealership, but fine. And then they go and do that. And then afterwards, Dwayne thinks he feels better, but then immediately gets in a huge fight with Francine and then immediately feels sorry about it and tries to get out of it. And it's a whole series of chemicals he thinks he controls oh, yeah. and then doesn't. And all the stimuli are very well placed to make it clear that he's very much functioning as a machine right now in the sense that... Lyle and Kyle put a lot of stress on him while he's going crazy. They're very forceful, and he can barely get them out of the office. He's rifling through his desk, and he happens to see a pamphlet in there for sex toys that was just junk mail that he got, and he kept it because it made him horny that day. He sees it by chance now, and it makes him horny again. That leads him to believe that, oh, I'm not depressed or crazy. I just need to bone. Yeah. So he bones his secretary, and when he doesn't immediately feel better, he blames her and starts basically, like, horribly abusing her verbally. Yeah. Just short of smacking her around, but accuses her of being a gold digger, you know, a bitch, a whore, and all this shit. After they have sex, she, they're just talking, and then at one point she kindly, though racistly, suggests, hey, we're in this hotel you own. You should make part of the property a KFC franchise because black people love fried chicken and the prison's right over there. <sighs> this would be a really Open good location for that. Very racist, and he goes, but she means well by it. How dare you be that racist? No. no. Well, then he agrees with her. Uh, he gets strategy. mad because he <laughs> thinks she wants to own it herself to make herself or money. Or manage it or something, yeah. Uh, in some way. And then she's like, no, I just thought it was a good idea for you. They get into a, an immediate shouting match, and then he tries to back out of it. And then he basically treats her as his mother uh, to like try to right. feel better. His own racism comes out. He's like, so you want me to own an, an N-word joint? Which I, is very much like... He tries not to be his stepfather, who is an extremely severe overt racist, and, but you see in his weak moments that that surfaces, and this is one of those moments. And then he immediately catches himself because he's finally said something mean enough, I guess, that it like breaks through that she's sad. And he crumples and goes, I'm so sorry. And she goes, fucking creepy. She goes like, it's okay, come to mommy. And Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> says, but see, mommy was her. She was saying she was mommy. That's the sentence. <laughs> that makes it much creepier. Yeah. And he's just like trying to explain the depths of the existential crisis he's going through to her. And she's like, yeah, it must be hard being a man. And Vonnegut goes into how she can't help Dwayne because she lives in a system that has taught her, as it teaches all the women in Midland City of this time, to not use their brains too much and to not use big words yeah. and to agree with the men around you. So what's she going to tell him? Like, what has she gleaned from life? What has she been allowed to glean from life that he doesn't know? Right. So she can't even, she can't really help him. 
But he cries. The yeah. end. <laughs> um, <laughs> cuts back to Trout trucking. He reveals yeah. in passing that his only son went to Vietnam and joined the Viet Cong, and now he's never heard from him again. Right. I want to read that book. <laughs> I want to read a fucking Rambo by Vonnegut where Rambo joins the VCs. That would be yeah. nuts. Yeah. <laughs> well, because also Vonnegut's book Galapagos is about Trout's son, but I don't think it, there's continuity there. I, I don't think it's the one, same. So I don't, yeah. yeah, I think it's a totally different thing. So he doesn't even do that, but that would be fascinating. Yeah. Ah. The other um, thing in his final trucking section is the trucker tells him about a town he passed through where the main industry is pulping books that no one gives a shit about anymore and <laughs> magazines and stuff. Yeah. And he says so there's just paper blowing all around the town and all they do all day is destroy the written word. And Trout's like, fine, great. <laughs> I'm a writer, but whatever. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I was in jail there overnight because I got drunk and rowdy or whatever. And you even wiped your ass with paper from books because they had so much. I wiped my ass with this short story, the sci-fi story. And he describes it and Trout's like in his head, oh, that's mine. But he doesn't tell him <laughs> right. that he was wiping his ass with a short story. Oh, yeah, story. that was the context on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> we go back to Dwayne, who's developed echolalia. So even though right. he's no longer seeing visions, now he compulsively can't speak other than to repeat things he hears. Yeah, and he has at least one whole conversation that way where he's just repeating. Makes for a very funny to, bit. Right, a little bit of a funny, you know, funny oh. sketch kind of thing, you know? Like, oh. yeah. Also showcases one of the themes of people being robots in the sense that Dwayne is entrenched enough in the system and the routine of these people's lives that no one is going to question him. He can act a certain amount eccentric. And yeah. no one will care. So right, right. he's not flipping out. He's just weirdly repeating everything you say. Everyone's like, yes, sir, Mr. Burns. Like no one, no one sees it as a cry for help because <laughs> he's rich and famous enough in the town. Yeah. And is outwardly may be fine some of the time. Right. Yeah. Oh, and also we should say when Dwayne is talking to Francine and saying he still feels, he says he feels lost and he feels like he can't quite figure out, he's kind of reveals to somebody that he's having trouble. And she says, hey, there's going to be an arts festival in town. You should go down there and meet one of those artists. One of those artists will tell you like what life's all about. Because oh, that's sorry, what they yeah. do. That's their gig. I forgot that's a crucial plot point because yeah. it's so stupid. And, so that, and then that sets us up for the collision of all three of our main characters, so to speak. Because Dwayne works his way down to the bar at the Holiday Inn where his son Bonnie is the pianist. And also Kilgore Trout is working his way into town to be there. At the same festival. And then also when the story is brought to this bar, then Kurt reveals about two thirds of the way through the book that he's in the bar too. And he's in town oh, yeah. and he's like, It's your classic I am here. Christopher Walken cameo two thirds of the way through. That's yeah. not a cameo where you're like, oh, he's in the movie now. <laughs> right. He's like very much part of it. And he says, I'm here to make these two people I completely invented run into each other. And also the story by Trout called Now It Can Be Told is going to be the thing that shoves Dwayne off the deep end. Right. And he also explains, I thought very humorously, all of his plot holes, like what are the odds that she would have said the art festival thing at that time? Right. I don't even know if, given the three days over which this book takes place, that's enough time to hitchhike from New York <laughs> to Illinois. Anyway, Indiana, it yeah. doesn't matter. I hereby declare that Trout is half a mile away, <laughs> and Dwayne's here now. <laughs> yeah, Because yeah. that's what I can do, because now here I am. I'm in the book, motherfucker. <laughs> he also, throughout this end, right before it, is determining the bust, waist, hips of women sizes, and then the penis sizes of men. Of Just men, giving yeah. you that in such a repetitive way that it's kind of deadening in a very effective way, I think, as a piece of writing. Like you're What's just the like, effect? Oh, yeah, everything, that's everything's few... arbitrary. Everything's okay. just put together by a, a creator who is, whether it's an author or God, just sort of omniscient and careless, I think. Yeah. Ah, you think he's trying to showcase the carelessness? Because, like, who has what size dick? Yeah. And you're like, well, this, you must have just picked numbers basically at random because who cares? Yeah, it's like a carelessness. Oh, well, you're like, oh, that's what God might be thinking yeah, about it's, your life. It's a paradox. I picked it at random. Who cares? It's a paradox <laughs> where he's careless and then also is actively determining everything, too. Like, he but has whim, decided yeah. everything, but he doesn't give a shit right. at the same time. And, and that's terrifying. I don't feel that I've fully unlocked that fully because he also talks a lot about the profit motive and how destructive it's been to humanity as a species yeah. and the lust for sex and how destructive it's been and then racism and how destructive it's been. And I think maybe, yeah, there's something about trying to deaden the lust impulse by just making it all dry. It's interesting. I don't know. Yeah. I still feel like there could be even more there. We should mention just because I want to talk about it in the meat. Dwayne has a burger at a restaurant, does echolalia. Like we said, no one mentions anything. Yeah. But 
because Vonnegut does this all throughout the book, and we'll get to why, you find out the full life story of the woman waiting on him. Yes, Patty Patty Keene. Keen. Who makes a keen patty? He eats a burger. <laughs> I, oh, I there's thought a, of it that way. Yeah. There, <laughs> most of the names, I do think there's something, some something stupid like reason, because a yeah. lot of them line up. And uh, God, it's hard to say. When but she, you find out that she was horribly raped, right. and she never reported it to anyone as part of her training to be a good woman, who is not unusual in any way. Yeah. And this is one of my favorite tangents in the whole thing. She was raped by a guy named Don Breedlove. Dong another another breed name. Breed love. That was the, like, the that's clearest the obvious one, to me. one. Yeah. Under the bleachers at a stadium that was named in honor of a kid who died playing varsity football at that high school. Yeah. And for a while, there was a law in town bearing his name that made it so that no structure could be erected that was taller than the monument to him, right. his dead kid. But now, a scant 30 years later, because the family moved away out of grief, no one's still alive who even knows that kid or remembers anything about him. In fact, he was only 12 years old. There wasn't much about him other than that he died playing football. So they scrapped the law so that they could erect radio towers, because those need to be taller than right. the monument. Yeah. That's a unique, weird, quirky, and devastating tangent to me itself. Yeah. Just I'm... like the how... Step by step, taking you through. A lot of authors go, you know, you'll you'll be forgotten sooner than you think. He step by step goes through like how quickly things are forgotten that you think are life defining. Yeah, and then there's also a tangent there where Patty thinks about how Dwayne is rich enough to change her entire life, and maybe and she has can her have own sex vision with him of just to just to get something fixed. Yeah. Right, and how arbitrary and unfair it is. Yeah. Money River kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and that's but, at the exact same time that he does his whole rant that seems unrelated until you realize they're all related and think about it for a second. It's like, incidentally, unrelated to this. And you're like, no, it's not, Kurt, you sly devil. Scientists just discovered all the theories about tectonic plates and shifts and like how there are these giant things floating around on magma that dictate when mountains spring up and there's nothing to be done about it. And then he's like, Meanwhile, this woman was raped and will be poor forever. And you're like, oh, I get it, like a tectonic shift. Or like, that's the mechanism yeah. I keep returning to this time where I'm like, oh, he didn't just stick that in at a random point. Right. It's that right. is the thing which you are supposed to compare to the scene that's playing out. Yeah. And you get more out of it. It's great. <laughs> So then we cut to George, a.k.a. Bunny, who we already know plays piano at the cocktail lounge. We already know because Kurt told us that he's going to have a rough night tonight because Dwayne's going to go crazy. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's going to happen soon. Bunny gets dressed. He lives in Skid Row, the poorest part of town. We learn his thoughts about himself, his whole life history, as you do with almost everyone you even passingly encounter. Yeah. And he meditates. He does basically classic transcendental meditation. He meditates to a mantra and imagines a blank void and lets thoughts just sort of drift through as they may and disappear and not mean anything. And I focus on that because I think it's an important message <laughs> to the book later. But that gets Bunny into the cocktail lounge, and now yeah. everyone's at the cocktail lounge, which is the end of the book. Yeah, it's the the big setup that uh, gets it all going. Also, it's the, you know how in a movie sometimes they will do the, let's say the title of the movie in this point. The mm -hmm. cocktail lounge is where they say the title of the book. A waitress gives someone a cocktail, which is just alcohol, and says, <laughs> Breakfast of Champions, which yep. is like an ironic, and then you understand how the title works. Also, at the very beginning of the book, and then right after this happens, Kurt does a disclaimer for General Mills and says, oh, they make no a fine way, cereal, yeah. and this is just, you know. We're using their yeah. trademark. But I also think there's a clear reason that is the title. It ha it really encapsulates in a single symbol one of the main things, right, which is we're all just trying to get by and find any way, no matter how stupid it is, to put a nice face on poison. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, like, drink your poison and let me make small talk and maybe life will be a little more pleasant for a second. Yeah, and I think also that a lot of symbols are hollow, and so. And you can accept, <laughs> yeah, you can accept that pleasantness or reject it because someone's yeah. about to reject it. Yeah. I also want to say, just in passing, they say he says in passing, "Oh yeah," and Trout passed by Sacred Miracle Cave, and he decided not to stop, and you'll never hear about that again. <laughs> yeah, right. So there, are, there are a couple arcs that just end. I kind of know why. I kind of don't know why. But Sacred Miracle Cave's done. You can forget it. Yeah. Well, and, then, and in the bar, the waitress initially seems like, oh, she's just here to do that Breakfast of Champions joke. But then she gets to talking to the people in the bar, and two of them are a gothic novelist named Beatrice Kiedsler, 
and then a minimalist painter named Rabo Karabikian. Oh, wow. That's exactly how oh, I pronounce it. Oh, we matched? It. Oh, yeah. yeah. Here we go. That means we get to end the episode early whenever that happens. <laughs> Don't have um, time. And so they get to talking to her, and Karabikian is a real jerk. We also find out that he has a painting called The Temptation of St. Anthony that's just a stripe on a solid, and that's it. And it's, he's been paid millions day, of dollars yeah, for it. It's a vertical orange day glow stripe of tape on an avocado green canvas 16 feet by 20 feet. Yeah, and that's uh, all So you can imagine it. Yeah, because like basically a crime scene's about to play out, so he does sort of an aerial view and places everyone. Francine went back to the car dealership, which is across the street from the cocktail lounge, in order to catch up on her work because she was out fucking the boss all afternoon. Although apparently he doesn't have to catch up on his work. I guess he's crazy. He gets a day off. Anyway. Yeah. And also uh, Wayne Hubler, who's been hanging outside the dealership all afternoon, one of the black wait staff of the cocktail lounge, invites him in for a free meal and to look through a peephole to see all the rich white folk and what they're doing. Yeah. So in other words, he's orchestrated all the characters to be right here right now so the thing can happen. Yeah, they're all in the vicinity. Yeah. And so Karabikian yells at everyone in the bar for saying that his painting isn't worth something be uh, because he argues that truth is sort of an illusion. And so that's what he's getting at with a painting that's just a stripe called The Temptation of St. Anthony, which is a, an event with people in it. And then as he keeps talking to the waitress, whose name is Bonnie McMahon, he says, yeah, tell me a story about your town. And she talks about the 15-year-old Olympic swimming girl in the town who's a big champion. And Olympic Kara, gold medalist. They're yeah. like most famous person. Right, right. And a nice story, you know? Friend of the show. And, and she also talks about how hard the girl's dad made the girl practice. And Karabikian says, what kind of man would turn his daughter into an outboard motor? Just the kind of smug, elitist right. thing Just an that you're like, thing to say. oh, fuck your stupid town. <laughs> They're also loudly heard talking about how this is the asshole of the America and shit. They're right. totally just They're being, being yeah. artsy douchebags. <laughs> and Vonnegut even says, like, many people in the town thought it was fucking crazy that someone was paying 50 grand for this giant painting. I also thought that. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah. Yeah. And when Karabikian says that, Kurt says, and now comes the spiritual climax of this book. He says that he realizes that all people are worth something in the process of his own character being an asshole. And he says that he didn't expect his own character to show him that in his own book. But here we are. And then uh, he says one of my favorite things in it, that at the core of each person who reads this is a band of unwavering light, that all people are a band of light, sort of like in that painting, but better. And then he has Kilgore Trout arrive. I guess I jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah, we should go back and say uh, Kilgore Trout finishes his trekking adventure. We don't need to say details. Wades across the river, the polluted river. Yeah. So he gets this plastic goop that is the pollution from the factory all over his feet. So his feet are encased in plastic. It doesn't matter that much. But for the rest of the book, imagine he has very hot feet. Right. He's ugly and shit covered and in a, like a ripped tuxedo. And he looks basically like a stinky vagrant. He goes to the hotel, hotel to check in. He is met by uh, Milo Maritimo or Maritimo or Maritimo or right. whatever you Maritimo. want to say. Who shocks him? And this is his punchline or like sitcom. Whoa. Shocks him by being like, Mr. Trout before he even says anything. Yeah. He's like, well, what are you talking about? And he's like, <laughs> everyone in town loves you because Rosewater let us read all your books, or at least the staff of the hotel. And uh, we all in the town think we want to make you like the patron saint artist of our town. You're going to be the next Da Vinci. We all love you. And other people at the hotel, his bus boy and like the lady who helps do the room down are like, we love you so much. And he's like, how dare you? I'm a piece of shit. That's why I came to tell you what a piece of shit I am. And they're all like, it's kind of player piano -y. They're all like, ha, 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 ha. So wise. That's so wise of you, how you hate everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so truthful and raw. We can't wait to see you at the arts festival. So he's sort of bewildered, and his whole point for being there has been undercut. So he just wanders down to the cocktail lounge to drink. Right. And back to you, Alex. I well, caught then, you up to where you wanted to be, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, and uh, Kurt sets up that Dwayne is in a position to accept pretty much any message that will be put into his head and accept whoever he sees next as an artist as being the person who will know about the secrets of the universe and how everything works because he wants to know how everything works and what the purpose is of life. And so then, because of how Kurt is making things collide, the person that Dwayne sees is 
asshole plastic footed Kilgore trout in this bar <laughs> and he runs over to asshole him plastic. and and so and wants to know what his purpose is and trout happens to be carrying one of trout's own books which is now it can be told well and it's like he's been hearing the same buzz everyone's hearing like he's yeah. literally a crazy dude who's been hearing people mutter have you heard about that Kilgore trout oh he's the next big thing he knows the truth so he right. sees him and he's like Tell me, fix my craziness. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and this story, now it can be told, is a story where the creator of the universe writes a letter to the one being who has free will, telling this one being that everybody else in the universe is a robot and they are just constructs and they don't matter. And so Dwayne immediately reads this and cracks up and he says, Oh, okay everyone's fiction everyone's made up and i'm gonna go ham on this entire room and just starts hurting everyone he can and this is to me the beginning of the parts that are unfathomably sad yeah because i don't find it unbelievable but i find it as sad as anything that you could say to me or have happened <laughs> that someone stricken with so much tragedy and sadness roiling in them who is now led to believe, don't worry, everything's fine now. I'm God, and I'm telling you, you're the only important one, and you can do whatever you want. It's fine. Yeah. He's like, good. I want to beat my gay son to death. That's his first he doesn't impulse. Kill him. But he's he doesn't trying kill to. Yeah. No, okay. Are you defending this thing? <laughs> no, here? no. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. His impulse is... And all of his ensuing impulses are purely hatred directed at only people who love him or admire him. Yeah. It's fucking sad as hell. Kurt very specifically says that there were no fatalities but 11 hospitalizations and right. that I the hospital yeah. had to bring out a like special super ambulance that has room for a bunch of people after a disaster. Fortunately, the ambulance is named Martha, which did save the world from Superman. For, and Batman vs. Superman. Batman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Martha. a subplot we don't have time Martha. to get into. Yeah. <laughs> and so Kurt also says that Dwayne, the route of Dwayne's chaos was like re-reported on the local news the next night because he, he basically goes from the hotel to the dealership beating the crap out of everyone only don breedlove deserved it everyone else is just Doesn't randomly deserve. in yeah the, well, let's go through this sights. he uh shoves his kid's head on the piano and yeah. drags it back and forth calling him a cocksucking robot to the point where they say his face can't be recognized so no he's right. not dead but it's pretty rough to it's do pretty, your own son it's awful yeah he runs outside and i want to jump back because i think wayne hubler is an interesting arc because it has no concrete ending and it's very weird yeah wayne hubler we get more of his life story and find out the thing about how like most of the things he's had sex with were dairy cows at the prison which is the milk that everyone drinks in the town which is just a weird aside about connect interconnectedness yeah but and about how hard his life is basically wayne comes out accosts him it's made very clear that wayne basically just wants to punch any black person he runs into wayne he says african dodger because it reminds him of a horrible thing from when he was a kid where you would go to the carnival and throw baseballs at a black dude's head yeah called african dodger he tries to hit him in the head but wayne is good at ducking so he like ducks and jumps and then jumps up on a car and because he gets up high on a car he can see all the lights of the airport turn on and it looks to him like his imaginary version of fairyland the place where he'll be safe and happy yeah. and that's the last you hear of wayne hubler so that's just interesting he doesn't get a life or a story beat he just gets an a fleeting momentary image that's the end of his story yeah it's interesting then he goes and beats up random people on his way to finding francine right yeah and then he publicly drags her around and breaks a couple of her ribs and Calling she her a gold digger and everything yeah. yeah and she doesn't deserve it at all and it's really terrible and, and you're right and he beats up the rapist which we're happy about <laughs> yeah but uh, but also kurt makes it very clear that that's not it's just by chance like yeah. a storytelling catharsis it's just it just happened and you know could have been anybody yeah, yeah 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 he's like i didn't want it to seem like in life evil people get their comeuppance but i also didn't want it to seem like i'm arbitrarily only making bad things happen to good people so I threw yeah. him in to make it realistic. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and the reign of terror ends because Kilgore Trout jumps on Dwayne, and uh, he's trying to grapple with him, and his finger ends up in Dwayne's mouth. Dwayne bites off the tip of it, goes and spits it into the creek, and then kind of snaps out of all this and collapses, and then is arrested, and that's it, and he's taken away. We're immediately told, in case you're interested in the epilogue style, uh, the actual story, 
he won't go to jail. He's too rich and famous. He's not going to kill himself ever. But Dwayne's future is that he will be sued by all the people he attacked until he is destitute and lives the rest of his life as a homeless dude on Skid Row. Yeah. So now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> Bonnie, his gay son, is destined to hate his father for a while and then somehow find a way to blame his mother instead and hate his mother. Right. And love his father. Which is crazy. Really interesting. Could yeah. be its own book, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, we're just told in an offhanded way. That's what happens to him, I guess. Yeah. Trout is taken to the hospital where he meets a pimp whose foot was just amputated, who's on a bunch of morphine. This is the epilogue, basically. Yeah. Well, li- literally the epilogue. And, and also, right before the epilogue, Kurt says, also, with any story of humans, there's no true ending because everyone's too interconnected. All you can do is an et cetera. And then he draws a giant et cetera. But then we go into the epilogue because Kurt, as an author, still has the business of Kurt going to meet Trout to tell him about the meaning of life as his creator. Right. He promised that he, as God, was going to explain everything, and we yeah. haven't seen that scene yet. <laughs> so our epilogue is going to be that. We're going to go there. Yeah. He meets this footless pimp who basically delivers the same ending Vonnegut always delivers, which is a puti wheat. It's very much that scene, just delivered in a different way. Trout meets a stranger who he doesn't know anything about, and through a long series of amazing coincidences I'm not going to explain because they're just to bolster the idea of interconnectedness, he knows how to imitate all the birds of the world. Well, you can explain if you well, want. Because black people <laughs> in the area were taught that through like a sure. lot of rid- ridiculous Through a series of historical coincidences, coincidences yeah. yeah. So the pimp is on a bunch of morphine, so he's just kind of acting on a whim, and he's like, i got to tell you something. you got to do me a favor. And Trat's like, what? And leans in close, and the guy just imitates a nightingale. Yeah, so the weirdest putty weed. The, weir- the word putty weed is not written, <laughs> yeah. but I loved how... That scene can be interpreted as just another ending that's putty wheat. Like, yeah. he's left again at a place where tragedy has just struck like a bomb. There's a moment of silence, and you just hear, like, the mundanity of a bird call. And you're like, man, life's crazy. <laughs> um, but there's a little more, because right. unlike Slaughterhouse-Five, God's going to come down and tell him the moral <laughs> Yeah, and, <laughs> after the putty wheat. And God, Kurt, is specifically waiting in a car because uh, Trout, once he leaves the hospital, just starts walking toward the new art center that he sees five miles away because it looks like a womb. And he's just like, all right, I guess I'll just walk toward that. And then Kurt, Kurt is waiting in a car to see also him. Also, Kurt depicts himself as like a bumbling sitcomish James Bond. Yeah. Like he, God, tries to smoke a cigarette because it looks cool, but he trips and like a dog yeah. that he forgot he wrote in named Kazak incidentally friend of the show <laughs> yeah. attacks him unexpectedly so he's like so when Trout finally came up I was on the top of my car looking really scared yeah God is like a doofus which I like he also, he also <laughs> very pointedly gives himself a penis that is three inches long and five inches wide which yes. is a chode I believe it's not a uh, great idea. it's a medical issue it's yeah. beyond a chode and he it's also, a tumor and he also when he jumps to avoid the dog his testicles recede into his body and it's going to require surgery to remove it like he horribly treats himself <laughs> decides, as god yeah he makes his story. genitals the most mangled <laughs> genitals of all the people in the story and he uh then trout walks up and kurt's like it's me and trout is like what the hell and tries to run away kurt catches up with him kurt's like you can't because all i have to write is you turned back have yeah. you seen stranger than fiction it's like that <laughs> <laughs> and then uh trout is like i don't believe you're really the creator and so kurt says okay and just takes him to every place on earth very quickly have you seen dr Str- Strange. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then uh, Kurt says, all right, I'm, before I offer you an apple, I need to tell you that we Americans require symbols that are very, very powerful. And then hands him an apple and says, ah, meaning. There you go. He shows him an apple and says, this is the meaning you've been seeking. To me, it makes total sense. And I hope we'll get into explaining why. But I do yeah. think you have to read it for yourself and figure out what it means. The last part is very open to interpretation. So I kind of just want to spell it out by the letter. Yeah. But yeah. Literally, it's described as he shows Trout an apple in his hand. He says, the beautiful thing Alex just nailed. (laughs) He vanishes. Then we just get Kurt Vonnegut's description of what he himself is doing. He is tumbling through a void that's very pleasant. It bears a lot of similarity in the description to the void that Bunny saw when he was meditating. He's tumbling through the void. He sees thoughts and concepts float by and drift off, and they don't bother him much. He sees that his mother's spirit's very, very far away from him because she left him a legacy of suicide, which is pretty rough. Then he sees a mirror... So he holds it to his face to see what he looks like. And then he says, because he's done these doodles all throughout the book, this is what I saw. He draws a picture of an eye shedding a single tear. 
Then it says, and I heard Trout, Trout crying out to him, crying yeah. out after me through the void, make me younger, make me younger, make me younger. Then it, then there's a drawing that says etc in giant letters. Yeah, same as the end before the epilogue. Yep. Yeah. And then when you turn the page, there's a self portrait profile of Kurt Vonnegut weeping as a very old man. And that's the okay. <laughs> that's the plot. psychedelic <laughs> dark crazy ending of the, the book. The ending is super psychedelic and yeah. includes drawings, so it's really hard to do on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we've also I've, I haven't read this as an audiobook, but a lot of people recommended. Hey, check out the audiobook of this because John Malkovich narrates it and also describes not, every drawing. That's amazing. And yeah. I looked, uh, I found a little clip of him t- in reading it, and it's pretty great. It would be, probably be a really good. Experience. Well, it's an asshole. It's just a drawing <laughs> of an asshole. <laughs> I can't do a good Malkovich, but man, yeah, that sounds yeah. fun. And speaking of, uh, you know, little pointed, exciting bits of the book, I think mm-hmm. we can get into another segment called Kurt Blurt. It's Kurt Over the place. This is uh, the segment where we talk about particularly choice lines or little moments within the novels of Kurt Vonnegut. And uh, this one has tons of them. Like I said, there's so much to digest in this book. There are parts where there's an amazing blurt. There's other parts where there's just a segment that feels like one. Like it's it's packed. I thought Serious Man, the Coen Brothers movie, was this way. It seems like an attempt to do one of the classic ambitions of art, which is to take away everything unnecessary until there's nothing left but the necessary. Yeah. It feels to me, and this is just because of my background and beliefs, sort of like a meditation like a thought exercise that he himself wanted to do when he was 50. Like, it's crazy that it includes to me just a separate section where he says, sitting in the cocktail lounge as Kurt Vonnegut, this is a very bad book you're writing, I said. I know, I said. Yeah. You're worried you're going to kill yourself because your mother did. I know, I said. So, yeah. like, this is a book that is also an experience he's having as he's writing it, I felt. Yeah. And because of that, and because he's trying to meditate and whittle it down to a very fine line, it is 90% gold. Like, (laughs) there is nothing (laughs) that I didn't highlight. You can start quoting on any concept and lift it out, and it's like, could be the best dictionary definition of that concept ever. Yeah. Like capitalism or communism or fucking anything. There's a rant about it in here. Dinosaurs. And it's amazing. <laughs> and that was so cool what you said before about how this could be his stand-up set. Because like it is something where he's boiled down huge things to this is the minute I would say about it. And it's really sharp and really prescient and really punchy. Like it's, totally. it's an incredible thing. Also, when he does appear in the book and tell himself that this is a bad book and I'm afraid I'm going to kill myself, he says, that is one of the scarier things i've ever read like it felt like it felt like this was a slasher movie and the slasher just showed up like oh oh now all of a sudden this this summer camp is horrifying and and somebody's gonna die that's where i'm really driving at this is what i got out of the ending was that he did this whole exercise and he sort of begrudgingly at the end tells you oh fuck there's nothing there i'm still scared of dying oh fuck you guys i did the thought exercise and it's the same. I feel the same. Yeah, yeah. That's how I interpreted it, but maybe I'm a depressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Let, yeah. Let's pick out a couple blurts. And let's then, do uh, it. And you got to go first because I wrote down 25 and I'm deleting them as we talk. In the in the preface, he's, ta- he's talking about that person, Phoebe Hurdy. I feel like a lot of authors will say, oh, let me tell you this true story of this person from my childhood. And it turns out not to be that interesting. He really makes Hurdy a cool lady and work. And my favorite part is he talks about that she was a copywriter for local stores in town. And one time they had a a straw hat sale and the joke she wrote was for prices like this, you can run them through your horse and put them on your roses, which is like (laughs) a really enjoyable and fun way to talk about a horse eating hats. It's really great. And to say that hats are cheap, really, really, really fun. So he, he really effectively in just a page or two makes her a lively lady. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. His high school was named after a slave owner who was also one of the world's greatest theoreticians on the subject of human liberty. (laughs) Uh, Doesn't even say Thomas Jefferson, but that's how he describes the kids. High school is called Thomas Jefferson High School. (laughs) Yeah. A related thing. In the first chapter, he's talking about, he immediately talks about America as a whole and like where the national anthem comes from, what the flag looks like. Also that on our money is a pyramid where the top block is hovering and there's an eye on it. And it's all real and it's all nonsense. And he said, Kurt says, quote, it was as though the country were saying to its citizens in nonsense is strength. Really killer bit about the whole thing. E pluribus. Woo. 
Um, <laughs> in that section, my favorite line was describing the settling of America very dryly as an alien would. But then he also says, The chief weapon of the sea pirates, however, was their capacity to astonish. Nobody else could believe until it was far too late how heartless and greedy they could be. And that was their strength, basically, of the yeah. conquistadors compared to Kaiser Soze. <laughs> he showed them what a man of will could really do. Compared to Squeaky Wheel Gets the Grease. Compared to Bartolome de las Casas, a great book. Too powerful. Or the author too of... Too powerful. Uh, yeah, book about the conquering of America. Just a good sentence about the horrible genocide that paved the way for us to do this podcast. <laughs> um, beautiful Southern California coastline. What do you got? We mentioned before Trout's epitaph, we are healthy only to the extent that our ideas are humane. I think I think that's right up there with the, the Mother Night pull quote about like, we are mm -hmm. we are who we pretend to be. It's also, really... a lot of his beliefs could be in the book of Bokanon. Like, that's a very Bokanonist also. Yeah, it's yeah. said in other words in Cat's Cradle for sure. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned it. I don't want this to count as one of mine, but people would be weirded out if we did mention it. The funniest of the penis lines, since you want to hear it, is... <laughs> penis lines. He describes the most highly decorated veteran in the town who just murdered his baby for no reason mm -hmm. that we are it's given a fun to book. understand. He had a penis 800 miles long and 210 <laughs> miles in <laughs> diameter, but practically all of it existed only in the fourth dimension. Yeah. <laughs> Dick time. It's so strange and unnecessary, but also makes <laughs> yeah. sense. It's great. Oh, there's also there's an amazing section where he talks about the overall idea that humans will decide their friends or enemies based on ideas. And it's not, the uh, content of the ideas doesn't matter. He says, quote, ideas on earth were badges of friendship or enmity. Their content did not matter. Friends agreed with friends in order to express friendliness. Enemies disagreed with enemies in order to express enmity. And even when they built computers to do some of the thinking for them, they designed them not so much for wisdom as for friendliness. Looking at you, Facebook. <laughs> like, yeah, no, we, yeah. we design really our virtual no. <laughs> reality to cater to our beliefs, not to instruct us. Yeah. Sometimes to instruct us, but the balance is off for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. And also that between that and other things about human psychology, I feel like the last few years I've really been learning that in debating people, it is really hard a lot of the time to find a debate where it's actually about the ideas. Like most of the time, it's just people yelling at each other because they or just want to be right or they want to be part of their tribe or like, yeah. and like, and like on all sides of all issues that happens a lot of the time. And so it's, it's really scary to think of that, but also I guess kind of a relief if you're getting sucked into a terrible debate. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of terrible debates, I disagree with everything you said. <laughs> no, no, I was just killing time, but here's yeah. one from the intro. Kurt speaking of as himself. My own mother wrecked her brains with chemicals which were supposed to make her sleep. When I get depressed, I take a little pill and I cheer up again, and so on. So it is a big temptation to me when I create a character for a novel to say that he is what he is because of faulty wiring or because of microscopic amounts of chemicals which he ate or failed to eat on that day. Which yeah. is a really hard way to construct fiction and truly believe that life works, but I do think that's how life works. And uh, as he yeah. says later in the book, People keep trying to make chaos order so that they can adapt to the order. The only thing you can actually do is adapt to chaos. Yeah. You can't be trying to figure out why people do what they do because it's a microscopic chemical imbalance that you'll never know. You have to just adapt to the situation as it is. And in fact, yeah. Wayne Hubler's epitaph is, uh, it's a lot like Animal House. You get everyone's epitaph is like the little post credit <laughs> thing. Yeah, you do. Wayne Hubler's epitaph, I imagined epitaph is, he adapted to what there was to adapt to. Which yeah. is like, and like that's the best he could have done in life, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which is so sad, but also there's like a heroism in it. I think it's great. Right. Um, yeah. One blurt for me that connected to it is there's a big chunk uh, about two thirds of the way through where Kurt talks about the idea that storytelling has he feels misled people in a broad way because it's led people to think that there is an order to all that chaos that can just be trusted in, but also then people make a lot of mistakes based on that because they think that, oh, it, like if someone's having a terrible life, if this were a story, it would be probably because they did something wrong, you know, because stories are moral and they have lessons. And so, yeah, can I do that section? That's one of mine. Or yeah. I have it down here. It's yeah, really great. Yeah. Because I think uh, he's just telling you one of the main answers of the book. So like, listen up. Yeah. It's very explicit. I thought Karabikian, who's the painter, with his meaningless pictures, had entered into a conspiracy with millionaires to make poor people feel stupid. I love that. <laughs> I thought Beatrice Keedsler, 
who's the novelist, yeah. had joined hands with other old-fashioned storytellers to make people believe that life had leading characters, minor characters, significant details, insignificant details, that it had lessons to be learned, tests to be passed, and a beginning, middle, and an end. This was the reason Americans shot each other so often. It was a convenient literary device for ending short stories and books. And so there's so that's much amazing. about the Vonnegut yeah. style. When I read that, I go, oh, that's why you write in the style you write in. Right. You're trying to... Be consistent with what you believe is good and true in life, and one of the things you believe is this aspect, and you're trying to make your writing truly fit that form, yeah. which is, yeah, to not create a fantasy world that leads people to expectations that will make their lives unbearably sad. You're trying right. to figure out how to make an honest novel that, yeah. like, tells people what life is really like but still is kind enough that they can, like, have some hope or something, you know? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and a novel that has only actual hope and like only fair hope you know right. which is basically impossible if you believe what he believes so it's a really yeah. difficult task but it validates so many of the <laughs> things he does where you're like i thought you were anti-detail why do i know the complete life story of every character we meet even in passing because one of my oaths is that i'm not gonna make a one character more important than another yeah because then you'll think you're the main character of your story and that's why Dwayne went fucking crazy do you not get the point of the book yeah. so like everything supports the point of the book yeah it's a crazy Crazy psychedelic romp, but it is not Kerouac, who I do think, and this is valid too, let his mind wander and didn't question where it wandered. This is rigidly structured for very concrete reasons right. that you can decode, and I like that about it. Because even that speech has built around it. You've just seen Karabikian's painting where St. Anthony is a beam of light, and so then Kurt so beautifully, symbolically says, people are beams of light. And that's my pictorial way to express that everyone has like a core and everyone matters and everyone's something. And to me, that is the last thread of hope when you're someone who thinks too much and becomes really depressed and existential about it, like myself. And many of us. <laughs> yeah, or gets yeah. depression, friend of the show. Um, <laughs> a friend of most podcasts, yeah. I think. Is that uh, <laughs> Transcendental Meditation knows this. People who practice New Age mindfulness know that, know this. One of those threads of hope you can grasp at is, well, there's moments in your life where your mind is clear and you're not thinking anything and you're just existing. And in those moments, you are just a pure awareness. You're just a machine that has sensory input. And there's something magnificent about that because in those moments, you are exactly identical to any other human being with sensory input. And it connects us all. And what else are you supposed to do? Trout says in the novel... Someone writes, what's the meaning of life on the wall in graffiti? And he says, to be the eyes and ears and conscience of the creator of the universe, you fool. Yeah. Which your boy Bradbury says in several of his stories, too, and yeah. believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, what are we here to do other than observe how spectacular this shit is? Right. And you can be miserable about the shit put in front of you or happy about it or nothing about it. That's your internal universe. The external universe is just shit happening. Yeah. And that can be hopeful if you boil it down to like, oh... I need to just relax like Bonnie does. <laughs> yeah. And it can be it can be a lot easier to tolerate, I think, if you don't have this out of stories expectation that, oh, no, it all ends like or like out of a video game, you know, like, oh, I'm just right. leveling up the rest of life. Right. Like that's how like, eventually I ambition, win. Ambition, ambition. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I don't have those, but... <laughs> well, we all do. It was uh, somehow decided that wide-open beavers, which were 10,000 times as common as real beavers, should be the most massively defended secret under law. So no. there was a madness about these wide-open beavers. <laughs> there was also a madness about a soft, weak metal, an element which had somehow been declared the most desirable of all elements, which was gold. Yeah. There's many quotes, and I'll skip all the other ones, but there's a lot of great quotes basically saying, look, two of the things that constantly fuck us... Dudes want to fuck everything, and, and everyone want wants everything. gold. That's, these are big problems. Yeah. Not that that's not an obvious thing that a lot of people don't comment on, but man, Kurt has a special skill for saying it in a way that's so pointed. Yeah. And, and great. So alien all of a sudden without you feeling like you're in a different book or something. <laughs> like It makes total sense. Like he describes New York by saying the whole city was dangerous because of all the bad chemicals and the uneven distribution of wealth and so on. <laughs> like, <laughs> Very <damn>. casual. <laughs> An alien now understands the problems with American society in one sentence. Yeah. It's amazing. Actually, off of that, uh, Trout is standing on the streets of New York feeling paralyzed. And Kurt says, quote, it had given him a life not worth living. But I had also given him an iron will to live. This was a common combination on the planet Earth. Nothing more to be said. Amazing. Uh, but from me, but fucking incredible. Yeah, yeah, that was one of my top ones. 
I think I have like three more. Cool. And I deleted some, so then I'll just power through. <laughs> but yeah, well, let's alternate. We talked about the scene where, about how systems have an inertia and there's like Dwayne is acting weird and no one cares. Yeah. And I think this is very poignant, especially today with our ability to live in a fact bubble for a period of time. So our ideas have kind of an inertia and we have to experience a lot more contrary evidence before like, fine, I guess I was wrong about that thing yeah. or that thing I read was fake. He just says the people of the people in the town, their imaginations were flywheels on the ramshackle machinery of the awful truth. Yeah. And I had to look up what a flywheel is, but after looking it up, it makes total sense. A flywheel is a thing in a machine that lets it keep going as it's supposed to go, even if there's like a jam while they fix the jam. Yeah, it like right. saves up extra energy and then keeps going. So just the idea that, yeah, there's inertia to concepts and you can act weird for a while before anyone will do anything about it. <laughs> Yeah, well, this one's kind of off of that. It's talking partly about the memorial we said before to the dead football player in town. But Kurt says about America, it was a very restless country with people tearing around all the time. Every so often, somebody would stop to put up a monument, yeah, which is great. like, I care deeply about like historical plaques on buildings and stuff like that. Like, that's just something I'm very, very interested in. And yeah. I've had experiences where like, like there was one time I was in a carload of people driving around the Chicago lakefront. And we went past this giant statue of a golden winged woman mm -hmm. just there. And I was like, what is that? And they were like, I don't know. No and I was like, cares. but I need to know. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, no one cares. That's and I think, life, I think we were all right. That it, yeah. That's crazy that that was there. But, but I don't no know. no one knows or cares. So somebody yeah. made an angel statue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It turned out it was from the World's Fair. It's just like a nice. thing, you know, but. There's yeah. that World's Fair detritus has really been scattered everywhere. You see World's Fair shit oh, yeah. out here and there throughout the world. That and the fire like built Chicago. That's yeah. the whole thing. When he bought the porno magazine, the cashier supposed Trout was drunk or feeble-minded. All he was getting, the cashier thought, was pictures of women in their underpants. <laughs> their legs were apart, all right, but they had on underpants, so they were certainly no competition <laughs> for the available wide-open beavers on sale in the back of the store. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it, said the cashier to Trout. He meant that he hoped Trout would find some pictures he could masturbate to, since that was the only point of all the books and magazines. It's for an arts festival, said Trout. <laughs> it's just the great. Best. It's just great. That's and you have to imagine that he looks like a homeless dude covered in dog shit when he's doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's for an arts festival. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, best excuse. <laughs> yeah. Like, I read it for the articles, you know? Right. But it, And also, I feel like one of my favorite ironies of this book is that in real life, it's been banned quite a bit. It was banned in Russia in 1975 mm -hmm. just because Kurt talks about beavers and then has one drawing of a vagina. And he tried to do a workaround where he replaced the animal beaver with a weasel and then just dropped the vagina, but they still mm. censored it. Uh, and then various school districts across America have censored it too for being mainly for saying, oh, it's pornographic. But it is like so jokey about all things pornographic and so detached oh about all of them. Like it's the least erotic book right. the description in the of world. <laughs> he gets an erection is like the alveoli in his penis created a valve system which allowed blood to flow in but not out creating an erection yeah you're not a kid going like oh shit this is hot i have confusing feelings <laughs> right it's, it's very dry so, like, so all bannings of it were being pornographic just Are i think stupid. really say a lot about the banner they really yeah, <laughs> yeah. Much of the conversations in the country consisted of lines from television shows both present and past <laughs> yeah what of it kurt Excuse me. Right. <laughs> GIF of stepping on rakes. GIF of stepping on rakes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kiedsler, Barbara Kiedsler does say one thing I thought was really fucking wise. Yeah. She says, uh, I tell any American today, of course you can go home again as often as you please. It's just a motel. I'm not going to fully unpack it, but I could write an essay on how fucking true that is. The phrase, you can't go home again, is like for a bygone age. <laughs> and now the problem is that the feeling of home is degraded. Oh, yeah. Well, in my, for me. No, I, 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 yeah, I see that. Yeah. Uh, this is a line from Kilgore Trout's Now It Can Be Told, when the creator talks to the being with Will. And the creator says... You are pooped and demoralized. Why wouldn't you be? Of course it is exhausting having to reason all the time in a universe which wasn't meant to be reasonable. Nice. Yeah. All right, I only got three left, so I'll power through. The first one's super long. Dwayne's bad chemicals made him take a loaded thirty-eight caliber revolver from under his pillow and stick it in his mouth. 
This was a tool whose only purpose was to make holes in human beings. It looked like this, picture of a gun. In Dwayne's part of the planet, anybody who wanted one could get one down at his local hardware store. Policemen all had them, so did the criminals, so did the people caught in between. Criminals would point guns at people and say, give me all your money, and the people usually would. And policemen would point their guns at criminals and say, stop, or whatever the situation called for, and the criminals usually would. Sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes a wife would get so mad at her husband that she would put a hole in him with a gun. Sometimes a husband would get so mad at his wife that he would put a hole in her and so on. That, I think, does the best job of summing up like, oh, that's what you mean when you say he's going to describe crazy shit, but as an alien robot would. Yeah. That's just, I thought, a really good example. Like, if you haven't read the book, that's what we mean when, we, yeah. when he has those rants. It's from that point of view. Right. Like, just how something's so important to whether people are alive or not. But literally trying to approach it without any of the normal feelings he would have. Like, he tries to approach it without horror or disgust. Yeah. Even though, obviously, you still arrive at that place by the end of reading it. But, yeah, so cool. And then uh, Trout is driving through West Virginia. Another big theme is uh, protecting the environment in this book. Good time to read this one, (laughs) Mr. Trump. The surface of the state, West Virginia, had been demolished by men and machinery and explosives in order to make it yield up its coal. The coal was mostly gone now. It had been turned into heat. The demolition of West Virginia had taken place with the approval of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of the state government, which drew their power from the people. An angel-faced white child with flaxen hair stood by a brook. She waved up at Trout. She clasped an 18-ounce bottle of Pepsi-Cola to her breast. That is a fucking amazing single shot in a movie where you're like, oh shit, they're in West Virginia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it says it all. I also, I like how he goes from saying, oh, all branches of the state government draw their power from the people and did this. And then not too long after he says, here and there an inhabited dwelling still stood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. all the people have been strip mined like the land. And then the last one, when he does show Trout the apple, the only clue he gives us to what the fuck it could mean, other than the fact that if you go back and track the fact that the apple is used throughout the book repeatedly, you get clues from that. But he says, what was the apple which even Adam ate? It was the creator of the universe, and so on. Symbols can be so beautiful sometimes. For me, that unlocked the mystery of what the apple meant and why he shows him the apple. I'm not going to say what I think, but I just want to direct people to that line being a good clue for helping you decipher that. Yeah, and so so keyed into the title and, yeah. and everything else about it. Because I actually don't know, I do think my interpretation is unique to me because I think one of the beautiful things he accomplishes in this is he creates a system of symbols, but one of the themes of the novel is that symbols are only what you yourself invest in them meaningfully. That's why yeah. flags recur so much. Yeah. And he chooses the symbol of an apple to mean what he wants it to mean at the time. And you have to decide what you think that is at the time that the apple appears. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. which is exciting as a reader. Exactly, yeah. (laughs) Fill in the blank yourself. That's all my blurts, though. Yeah, my last one was the West Virginia thing. So I think we can jump into another segment called Recurring Characters Update. We're all merging. Oh, we're all back. Into one massive character. We're all back. I'm still mostly a dude. There's very little of me as female. (laughs) It's the one giant character that's all Kurt characters melded yeah. together. We just conducted an experiment. I'm still room. basically a white dude. It's weird. I guess <laughs> it just averaged. This book is a real catch-all for all kinds of different Kurt characters because it's mostly constructed of past Kurt characters who you have met before, probably, if you've heard other episodes of this show or at least some of them. Kilgore Trout is throughout. He's the main character in Timequake, also in God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, Galapagos, Jailbird, all kinds of other Kurt books. Elliot Rosewater's in this, main character of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. He's in the hospital, also in Slaughterhouse-Five. And then Francine Pefko is a name that comes up in Cat's Cradle, but totally different lady in Cat's Cradle. She's just, like, young and not very smart and kind of airy in Cat's Cradle. But in this book, she's uh, much more and also uh, has horrible things happen to her. So it's tough. (laughs) I don't know that she's much, much more, but she's, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's still very much shackled by being a woman at this time and place. Yes, definitely. And then we're going to see Dwayne Hoover and his deceased wife, Celia Hoover, as alive people, both in Dead Eye Dick. The Maritimo family will also come up a lot in Dead Eye Dick. Rebo Karabikian is the main character in Bluebeard, and also his paintings come up in Dead Eye Dick. Then Kurt uses the name Cash Drawer Miasma again, which was in Player Piano. Great name. I'm glad he brought it back. Really exciting. Loose Leaf Harper from Happy Birthday Wanda June 
comes up in this book again. And also Kurt says, I'm reusing Loose Leaf Harper within the book, this, yeah. which is fun. And then Midland City is a stand-in for Indianapolis. That's very Kurt. There's lots of Indianapolis stand-ins. And Kazak is in a lot of different Kurt books, in particular Sirens of Titan as a female Mastiff and is also a seeing-eye German shepherd in Galapagos, and then as a Doberman in this. So, stand-in dog name. That's Kazak materializes wherever Kazak wants to materialize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it really is, a, when we talked to Mark Leeds, who's the encyclopedist for Kurt, he talked about seeing all of his works as one long scroll and one really extended thing, and this one's definitely made out of all of its previous works and also ends up being sources for a lot of future ones. So it's a real Kurt party. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. And then from there, why don't we move into another segment? We would usually do a whole Kurt Cameo segment. Kurt mm. Cameo, I feel like we've covered that he's in the book as a major character and, sure. and what he does. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean we don't do a wacky intro for it? Kurt Cameo. Yeah, Kurt we're doing cameo. the intro. <laughs> Kurt Cameo. Kurt Cameo. So there, sense of professionalism. <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't know if you want to get it, if we should get into... Watts or meats or other things next, but there's a lot of ways Watts, we can go. Watts, meats? I'm down for meat. I'm down for what's. The what is going to be kind of meaty this time. Let's do this. Those will be a combined. We're going to improvise a lot right now. What? Meat? Those will be a combined segment, right? Uh -huh. Watts and meats will be a combined thing. And before we do that, I want to get into a segment called Related Reading. Really? Yes. We usually do wow. this later in the show. Related reading. Related, related reading. reading happening Related now? reading. We're going to do this right now. I don't know what to believe. It's a segment where we, we talk about other writing we love that this reminded us of or connects to hey, in why? some way. Why now? What's going on in because that noggin? <laughs> it's because I have two of them and my second one is oh, crucial to a lot of my reading So of what's going to happen now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I can, the first one is not so super crucial or nothing, but I think it's good. It's a segment of the Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury, and it's called The Earthmen. And it's about, in the book, it's the second expedition to Mars, which is a populated planet. And the humans arrive on Mars and start showing up at the doors of Martians to announce themselves and be like, we're here. And the Martians are just mainly annoyed with them and kind of treating them as like business they just sure. need to deal with. And then there's really interesting and humorous and clever twists from there as to why that is. Nice. Yeah. I have too many as usual. The first one is <laughs> uh, recommended viewing and playing a science show called Connections with James Burke. Do you know that show? No. Cool. Great. Well, you should. You'd freaking love it. Everyone would who yeah. loves, who likes this podcast. James Burke's an amazing science personality and, and historian who basically does a show that you can find easily online on YouTube, I believe, and elsewhere, where he teaches you fucking amazing science and history facts like you would love if you read Cracked, but all in a connected way, which reminded me very much of the structure of the tangents in this. Cool. So an episode will be like, Here's how soap is made. The guy who discovered that had syphilis, famously. Here's how syphilis Whoa. works. That bacteria was then descended to this, which made this king mad, which is why this war happened. Oh, like, awesome. It's a never-ending whirl of like, wow, I know a bunch of stuff, but most of the times I think of history as very sensible. This makes it seem like history is just this crazy swirling hurricane, which it is. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate that. They also made a very old school video game of it that you probably have a hard time finding, but it was fucking awesome, where you Wait. walk around and find things and learn how the science works and solve puzzles. And oh, through the cool. connections, you teleport through time and stuff. Oh, like a Carmen San Diego type game. A, but... cl a point and click adventure puzzle game. Yeah. From yeah. like the LucasArts era. Oh, that sounds amazing. Connections with James Burke. That's great. Yeah. I can do my other one, but I do feel it. like it leads oh, straight okay. into Well, then stuff. I don't need to say shit about this. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey. Everyone yeah. knows it. Most of you have probably read it. If you haven't, read it. It's my favorite like psychedelic book from that like yeah. era where that tone was popular. If you've seen the movie, it's one of the only cases where I feel I can say this. The movie and the book are both phenomenal masterpieces, and they're totally different. There's so much in the movie that they knew they couldn't accomplish from the book, and they didn't even try. So the movie is great and different, and you'll read the book and be like, I don't remember fucking spiders made of flesh stitched together and shit. <laughs> the book blew my mind because I'd seen the movie five times. And then read the book and was like, oh, completely fresh, new experience. It's like not even like reading an adaptation. It's a different story. It's awesome. Yeah, both great. Like, both great yeah. in their own way. Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by Jonathan Safran Foyer. Another one people have probably at least seen bouncing around because it was like a bestseller. I've heard of it. I've never read it or a seen it. A few years movie. ago, had its moment. 
It's about a kid growing up and understanding 9-11, but it's in the way The Breakfast of Champions is. It's about everything, and it's actually about the thoughts of all the people, and it's actually about all the drawings and interconnectedness of all people who have ever existed in all time and, like, feels a lot like Breakfast of Champions now that I... Completely different tone, completely different style of writing and subject matter, but there's so many, like, the use of structure and the tangents and stuff and how much wisdom these people can unearth is similar. Cool. Right after I read it for a long time, I was going around being like, new favorite book, new favorite book, holy shit. Oh, wow. It's very good. Yeah. Real tearjerker, though. All right, you go. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, my uh, my other one is The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Okay. Yeah. And it's... Similarly an, banned. <laughs> yeah, similarly banned quite a bit. Considered one of the great American books. You've probably heard of it and probably read it in school or otherwise. So it's not like a shocker to reveal it to you, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But I think... This time around reading Breakfast of Champions, I think I realized that consciously or not, that's his Huckleberry Finn. Breakfast of Champions is his attempt to grapple with all of America and all of its problems and all of what it means to be a good person within one book made out of previous characters and previous situations. Yeah, like Rosewater was that, but just about money. Yeah. And that plot and moral is in this book, but so are like four other ones. Yeah. It's like he took... Most of his books focus on one moral, and he tried to do a book where he combines them all in like a bundled package. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, and from Kurt talking about his own book in Breakfast of Champions, and then also what I've read about Twain writing Huck Finn, there was like a lot of struggle writing it, a lot of stopping and starting, a lot of trying to figure out what it was, and also a lot of grappling with how dark and awful the book either could be or would end up being. Because yeah. like Huck Finn is about an escaped slave and a young boy who's had an abusive, terrible childhood. And they're both probably going to get harmed if the book goes the way you think it's going right. to go, especially toward the end. And uh, in a past episode, I recommended George Saunders' intro to Huck Finn. So just go ahead and keep reading. Yeah, just so keep go going. Yeah. So get the whole thing. And uh, his intro, he, claim, he argues pretty convincingly that Twain backed off of the dark ending he could have done and whether or not oh, that's a good idea there sure. could have been a much worse ending where like of course there could. where jim is like executed <laughs> right. or something like you know and it's a book where he really grappled with whether his funny book was supposed to be so awful and so expansive yeah. and didn't maybe even didn't feel good about the final product in the end but he just couldn't stop shitting on the Gilded Age. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're going down the river and everything they see, I see why you see the connection. Everything they see, Twain cannot help but be like, and here's a little rant on how this is bullshit. Right, Like, right. it's a bunch of vignettes of them running into people that represent what's wrong with America. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even Twain is a little bit in the book. Is like, right away, Huck Finn says, if you know about me, it's probably because of the adventures of Tom Sawyer. By, by Mark Twain, Twain which, which is bizarre. <laughs> like, like Bizarrely meta for that time period. Yeah, yeah. right away. And also, and also, obviously, both books jump to mind for me because there's a lot of racism depicted in them mm -hmm. and there's some possible racism on the part of the author depending on how you read it yeah but i think also a lot of depicted racism that and depicted violence uh, and other terrible things that actually exist <laughs> and so of uh, course and uh being confronted effectively or not you know it's a tricky thing to confront though and i think it's especially messy and difficult for a white author yes. to confront it not that it never should be done Right. But to confront it and not simultaneously reveal your own like implicit biases that you still ha have in your in you. <laughs> yeah, there's an extra degree of difficulty and there's yeah, an extra absolutely. risk because of blowing it. You're trying to be empathetic and understand something that you can't have lived through so you can understand it to a point but not fully. <laughs> right. And right, and right. it's nice that you're trying to bring attention to human suffering, but it's also it's just a tricky subject. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, I hadn't thought of it. it even, it maybe it makes it even a little more fair or, or if not that more sensible that Kurt writes from the perspective of an alien so often in this book, because sure. like he's basically an alien for the suffering of black people in America. Like yeah. he's just observed it That's a lot true. and tried to capture it. But beyond that, he doesn't like know it firsthand or anything, you know? All right. Well, let's not what yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's not blow our what. <laughs> the region between is the oh. Harlan Ellison short story I'll recommend. Nice. Now that I mention it, I think I may have recommended it earlier. But if you haven't read it, friggin' catch up. I don't remember it, but still. Well, let me describe it and yeah. see if you remember it. Oh, yeah. It's the crazy psychedelic one that is about a soul 
that has been captured at the time of death by an, a powerful alien that deals in souls and yeah. fills orders for souls that are needed to animate creatures so, that have lost their souls. Yeah. So it's like this endless series of vignettes of a thing reincarnating over and over and over, trapped in the lens of the succubus, it's called, waking up in a completely new existence and understanding where even the laws of physics might be different. Like it wakes up once and it's just a blue field with a purple field approaching it and it has to figure out what what oh, does I it think do? You did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well it's, it's got a bunch of wacky drawings and experimental typesetting. So oh, it reminded cool. me of this. That's a good one. Yeah. And then uh you're done, right? Yeah, I'm done. All yeah. right. So last but not least, the self plug. And Ooh, it goes like this. It's our show. And it goes like this is the name of the story by me. Oh, I thought you were gonna be like, it goes like this, and then on da, spool, da, da, what da, the thing da, da, is. Da, da, it's called Robocop. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, no, the story is called And It Goes Like This. It's my own uh attempt at f- a fable that is mostly symbols which are like I would call intermediate difficulty to decode. Okay. It's the I usually go really clear yeah. and it's like the most I've ever gone whimsical and like it reads like a magical fable it's about an island where there's an arts festival every year. Oh, well, and, okay. And uh, yeah. it all climaxes <laughs> in an arts festival that goes horribly awry due to violence breaking out. So, similarities. Oh yeah. But it's about like a fantastical, mystical tribal people who do this arts festival every year on their volcano island and a bunch of shit happens. Oh, that sounds great. And it's written like uh, an Aesop's fable. I'm going to read this. You can find that on my Tumblr, seriousswame.tumblr.com. Yeah. And probably in the links to this. Nope. I'll <laughs> I will Not here. hack in and delete it. Yeah. Also, I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but we sometimes get messages from people saying, hey, that related, re- related reading section, I can't keep up with the, all those rapid fire amazing things. How am I, Can I get a list of them or something? Mm-hmm. There is a list. It's in the description on iTunes or SoundCloud. Michael or just deletes page. it every time. <laughs> no, it'll be <laughs> that there. That scam. It'll be there. Yeah. The, oh, those were great. I, yeah, I want to yeah. share that story too. And uh, I think now we can get into the Vana What Meat. Oh, the Vana What Meat. Boy, here Mecca segment. Comes Mecca that segment. Meat. Mecca segment. What? <laughs> Two segments combined with the power yeah. of five segments. This is this is a segment where we grapple with the entire meaning of the book and in ways that uh, oh, we okay. haven't already yet. <laughs> uh, that we often do, if you've never heard the show before, we often do a segment called Vana What about things that maybe are offensive sure. or are offensive in the book and then uh we also do a segment called the meat where we get into any huge meetings that we still want to get to but the so meat we're gonna leaks. do them we're the gonna meat. do them both right now because they kind of connect I think. the meat is not well contained the meat tends to leak out throughout yeah. the podcast we tend to have done the meat at least 75 percent i'd like, say yeah we like when to, we chew, get to a, chew on the end of the meat yeah as, <laughs> i'll abandon that in the attic of the house you see that's the meat area of all right anyway yeah the blank look on your face makes it clear to me that you forgot our running bit of comparing. Oh, the house! Oh to no, the layout of the house. Okay, I, I don't know. I'm so I'm so <laughs> in like, that meat I'm moment. I'm in meat mode yeah. now, man. Yeah, I'm not in the Vana house, man. I'm out. I'm yeah. in the yard. All right. Well, let's ask yeah. what of this meat. So I think because often this book has the N word very frequently, and that's a word I I don't even feel comfortable saying in a completely clinical way. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah. And it also has uh, a lot of female characters who are not necessarily very intelligent, and also some female characters who are physically attacked either in the present of the book or in their backstories. And it also has a lot of, I don't know, just sadness to it, and a lot of suicide in it, and a lot of, there's a transvestite character in it who gets treated somewhat poorly, there's a gay character in it who gets treated very poorly. Not to say that any of those are invalid decisions as an author or as a writer, Right, because certainly they're all things that were happening around him at that time. Living in the modern day, you want to be like, is this terrible use of that approach or is it not? Yeah, and I just, I want to just encourage readers routinely and human beings to always read things and take into account all the factors of the thing, including like the time period and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, like you just said, I think the real crux of it is, and everyone has to figure it out themselves, in my own life, like... With issues that face black Americans, I feel like I can do the most by using what little platform I have of people who listen to me to amplify black authors who are writing things on the issue that I think are valid. Yes. But I tend not to write my own thoughts on the issue. That said, a novel's a different thing. 
The other side of the coin, obviously, is you can't say, well, now people can only write autobiographies of things that happen in their life because that's all they understand. Right, that, which is probably too far. Right. Yeah. So I'm not trying to stop anyone from writing anything. What I am encouraging people to do is to question whether simply depicting horrible things does anything good or maintains and normalizes those things. And I don't know the answer. I'm not telling you that I think it's the normalization one and that Kurt's bad. But I will say that we're going through, I think, a period of awakening for artists and like creatives right now in America. So what occurred to me was like, man, it's so true. And it could be very important for someone who's reading this to be exposed to maybe the kind of racism that they thought didn't exist, especially yeah. if you were reading it in 1973, and be like, holy shit, he's unflinchingly showing that, man, basically every white character you meet is racist, even the nice right. ones. Harry LeSabre has the code word reindeer. Yeah. Speaking of get out, that's weird. Their code word oh for black God, people yeah. is reindeer because right. they are also racist but are sensitive enough that they don't want to hurt the black people's feelings. So they'll be like, there's too many reindeer in this neighborhood now because they don't want anyone. So like even the likable white people are racist. And that I think does two things and it's hard to determine to what degree. One, it can make you meditate on the tragedy of racism and that's important. Two, I worry that it can depict a world where everyone has secret racist thoughts and that's normal to have. Yeah. And by doing that, perpetuating that. So, for example, Wayne Hubler, the black character that we most identify with or has most of an arc, he pointedly twice, and this is where I actually think he goes over into what territory, meaning like I actually think this was not helpful. Yeah. Even though, on the whole, I think Kurt is trying to do a humanitarian book here. Yeah, same. And that's why he included this black character who has had nothing but bum deals. But... He pointedly multiple times says, and then Wayne Hubler just stood around doing nothing because there's nothing for him to do. I get it. Black people are treated as vestigial in society. However, this here in this book where you are God, where you literally are saying, and I can make anything happen, you're still making the black character have nothing to do. So you are also normalizing through your lack of action, especially in a book where you're explicitly saying, I'm God, I chose everything that happens, to say... Wayne Hubler had nothing to do, so he didn't do anything. The end, forget about him. I think it's both. It's true that some black people are treated disposably, yeah. but it's also, I think, goes into the territory of like normalizing that experience because this is the identity black character in the book, and that's the only thing he has to offer is how expendable black people are. It's yeah. like when... Some black people I know say, I can't wait until we can make movies with all black cast that don't comment on slavery. Not that that can happen now uh, because yeah. it hasn't, we aren't healed yet, not by a long shot. Right. But to boil a black person down to only their suffering also becomes problematic. You can fetishize that, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And especially from the outside of it, I think. So that's my rant on that. And I'm going through this transition in my own writing, and I think we live in an exciting time. And I'm certainly on board with all the people who are like, oh, dude, yeah, I want to be as sensitive as I can be and, like, nice and everything. I also want to write things that are meaningful and true. I'm never trying to be mean to anyone because it's always love. But it's interesting to navigate what you can say that you think is helpful. It's not always helpful. Even things that come from a good place. Yeah. <sighs> Did I cover my ass enough on that? <laughs> no, it's all real. It's yeah. good. And just to end that thought, I highly recommend the episode of the podcast Revisionist History, which is Malcolm Gladwell's podcast. Yeah. Their season finale this season was an episode called The Satire Paradox, which sort of talks about why Stephen Colbert is so genius, among other things, but at the same time how we in America have defanged satire to the point that it doesn't do anything that you think it does. Yeah. Um, they ran a study yeah, that showed that. the people who watched the Colbert Report, he had huge ratings among liberals and conservatives. Conservatives thought that, oh, I know he's playing a character, but when he says, you're just a crazy bitch to a liberal person, he kind of means it, and that's why I like him, and I know he believes what I believe deep down. And liberals yeah. would say, oh, no, it's a total satire. He's calling her a bitch because he believes the literal opposite of that. Isn't it great satire? How could a conservative misinterpret that as supporting them? It supports me. The point being that satire really has to be fucking clear. If your point right. is to be funny, to really be well. funny. If your point is to... Be funny, but also advance a social agenda or a political point. Make the priority being clear what you really think. Yes. Sprinkle jokes in if you must. 
But like, yeah, and that's going to change the way I write satire because yeah. I'm totally guilty of that. Like writing stuff that I'm like, in retrospect, it doesn't challenge your opinion, if, even if you believe the thing I think is evil. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, and I think with this book, Kurt is super successful with satire and very effective at it. And it's really interesting reading this on the heels of Happy Birthday, Wanda June, because I feel like in that play, he is much less successful a lot of the time. Like sometimes it works, but other times he's just showing the main character in that Harold Ryan being terrible and it, whether or not it's funny, it also isn't just that isn't really that effective. A lot of the time as a satirical thing, he just keeps doing horrible things as the play goes on. Yes. And I think this book is much more successful at that. And then as far as what's and the meat of it, I brought, wanted to bring in Ray Ring because he really is trying to Huck Finn all of America. Like it, it yeah. and so it's kind of like in, in Huckleberry Finn, if they didn't use the N word, no one would seem that racist, probably. Like, it wouldn't right. be effective at, at what it's trying to do. And I think this book is, in a lot of ways, that same thing. Like, there's a lot of times where someone will be racist or sexist or violent in real life. And yes. you need and to he depict knows it, it to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. So it's the time when, like, stuff seeps in that I suspect is not intentionally structured as satire. Like yeah. I said, the animal adjectives. A lot of adjectives are leading yeah, he'll do that before I read into yeah. them. Anytime he mentions homosexuality or transvestitism, <laughs> yeah. he uses adjectives like comical, obscene, or hilarious. Right, and he's not. Yeah. He is literally, he's including a transvestite character who is smart and capable in order to illustrate the point that it's foolish to think tran being a transvestite is wrong. Yeah. So great. he's saying the right thing, and I agree with him. Yeah. But he can't not call it like silly that right. someone would be gay or wear <laughs> women's clothing. So it's a mixed bag in that way. And that's all throughout with every issue. Like it bothered me. It's good and bad. He makes several pointed jokes about how Trout doesn't know how to write female characters and is shitty at it and has no female characters. Yeah. That means. Which was great. He knows that about himself. Yeah. Yet, he made no further effort to fix that, I would say. Yeah. He just thought making a joke about it and admitting he's aware of it is enough. Now you're done. Yeah, I think one of my favorite Trout stories ever is in this, which is a story called The Smart Bunny. Yep. And it's which, a really... Which men used to patronizingly call women if you're not older than 30 and you don't know that. Right, right. She's a, a smart bunny. And it's a really it's a really clever short story where there's a literal rabbit who is born with a human level intellect and then just throughout her life thinks it's a disability well, or a deformity. Well, and a human sized brain, so her head is yeah. huge. Right, right. And she and, thinks it's a def yeah a deformity because she has all these crazy impulses. Anytime she tries to do anything, all the other rabbits just act like you're fucking nuts and go back to doing five basic things. Right. So she learns to just do those things and not think anymore. <laughs> right, right, and like live with her her problem. Yeah. Yeah. And then Kurt in talking about it says that it's trout's only female protagonist which also he kind of undercuts trout too because it's a rabbit too like it's not even right. that much of a success he hasn't he still hasn't written a human woman successfully you know yeah but yeah it's a clever dig at himself too and then like you said but also not something he works on still yet <laughs> right and then i think the further you go back in time people are, feel very free to be racist against Asians. And I think we still yep. are way more freely racist against Asians, which itself is almost a racist term because when I say Asian, most people think of like a person from one of any, like 18 different countries. Right. So it's even like a it's pejorative term. It's like, term. you know, yeah. Africans. And it's, <laughs> right, there, there's exactly. such differences between those but countries. So like he calls Japanese people yellow robots fueled by rice. Right. And he says, which which is within him describing all people's races as just their colored yes, people. Yes, but he so, doesn't say white but he doesn't. people are pink robots fueled by hot dogs. I just think the true, yeah. fueled by rice can only be like a get it. They like yeah, rice. It's like a joke. It's just weird. Just racist. Yeah, uh, especially when you know that the chicken thing is racist. You right. don't know the rice thing. Anyway. Right, right. And of course, someone could come back and rightly say, Japanese people eat a lot of rice. That's, what's wrong with that? <laughs> I don't know, man. We're all trying to navigate this. And then the other one along that line that just really, I cringed when I read it, is there's no reason for this to be true. It doesn't connect to anything or mean anything. But he describes Fred T. Berry, the head of the arts festival, as looking so much like a Chinaman that he had taken to dressing like a Chinaman. Real Chinamen often mistook him for a real Chinaman. <laughs> Yeah, he Stop really Stop saying China man. <laughs> yeah. He I don't I, he I think was writing either writing before the time we all decided to stop saying that or yeah. just kept saying it. I don't know which, but it's not great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
but all yeah. every Italian is a gangster. Yep. Um, so those are just like, again, I'm like, those are not ragingly huge social problems, but it's funny how you still have the unchecked biases of like, I want a crime family. I know. I'll name them the Linguinis. You know? <laughs> and people still do that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been a lot. I think it's been all the way back to player piano where I had something that I think will blow your mind. Oh, do but it. I have something. Do it. Do it. I, thought, I thought my Huck Finn thing would blow yours, but I, I, it seems to be normal. Oh, it did. Normal. It yeah. did. I'm just very tired. <laughs> um, did you notice yeah. that I notice everything. Trout's yes. whole trip is a series of escalating vignettes rubbing in his face that the printed word has lost all meaning? Yeah. To arrive at the play, okay, well, I'm done. But it blew my mind this time because it escalates in a perfect way. Obviously, the tip-off is the story where the guy's literally wiping his ass with a story Trout wrote. But way before then, the first thing when he's hitchhiking with the truckers is he starts seeing signs on the side of trucks like pyramid trucking. Yeah. And he makes a point of like, that doesn't mean anything. There's not pyramids in there. The truck is not like a pyramid. <laughs> Why would you apply that word and paint it 10 feet tall? Right. Like it's important and it means something. The guy's like, they like the way it sounded, pyramid trucking. <laughs> and that climaxes in one of my favorite things, which is he literally sees, and you see a doodle of it, a truck that's a double truck pass, and it's called peerless, peerless towing or whatever. So it says peerless, peerless. So it's literally an oxymoron because to be oh. peerless is to be the only one. Yeah. So they painted <laughs> the giant, the word peerless 10 feet tall twice. It's, terrible. it's like no one cares what words mean. And then the very next scene is the guy like, yeah, also I wipe my ass with books. <laughs> so I just love that. Again, the whole book feels like it has almost no structure and is chaotic, but everything is well in hand I all the time. I never even noticed that peerless thing. It's great, that, yeah. There, there, that there's two of them. It's, <laughs> um, we talked about... It's literally untrue. Talked about mindless meditation, man from space. I'll just yeah. say stranger in a strange well, land and being there are great if you want more views from an alien. <laughs> yeah, and, and what you observed about it all being at least tied to or about transcendental meditation is really cool. Or at least that's a way of, or that, that that reading exists is really cool. Yeah. And I think it's like Huck Finn or a lot of other great books where you can sit and read it. Like I'm going to read it in a feminist way. I'm going to read it in yeah. a capitalist way. I'm going to read it. in you know, there's 10 different interpretations you can go in and then you pull it out throughout like, Oh, yeah. this whole book was about that. All right, more meat. I'm slicing meat yeah, yeah, off slice, like slice. it's a fucking Flintstone style side of dinosaur <laughs> brontosaurus meat. So I was saying earlier that this book made me, it clear to me all the reasons his writing style is the way it is. Yeah. And so I just wanted to run down like the ones that at least that popped out at me and see if anything popped out at you. The reason we constantly have this obsession of knowing about everyone is he wants to show that people have the same importance and people are not, there's not a main character in everyone else's background, right? We talked about that. Yeah. The recurring theme of this book finally explains why he says so on and so it goes and and so on so much. Yeah. And people need to know why because it's beautiful. He describes the polluted plastic that's in the river that coats Trout's feet. Then he does a doodle of the chemical structure, which is a long sheet of you know carbon and hydrogen, whatever, linked up with lines. And at the edge, it says, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, et cetera, is the words human use, humans use to show that the pattern continues indefinitely the same. And then he ends the book that way with that exact same doodle of the word, et cetera. Yeah. And he several times calls out this theme is super important. It's one of the keys to the book in my mind and to his whole writing style in general. The end, so on, and the so it goes, these are prayers and they are part of his religion, and part of his religion is he believes in an ultimate continuity and renewal, and that there's nothing, it's not going to change, there's only this forever ad infinitum. Yeah. And the book even ends that way, and that's why I take it very sad, because you fucking have a dude, Trout, who says that he's learned that life is not worth living. After a lifetime of searching for truth, he's failed, and he understands all the ins and outs. He meets God, and his wish he, like he even gets a wish he missing he thinks he gets one wish i guess is make me younger make me younger make me younger so even and he's kurt he's the kurt stand-in yeah so to me the book is saying i went through this whole process as a 50 year old man refreshed myself and even says trout yells it in his own father's voice so he's saying and now after i did this whole process i still even i would still wish to be younger again and go through this bullshit again 
Yeah. Because that's how fucking pathetic our situation is. We have an iron will to live and would want to be younger, even if we're at the end of our life and realize it was all crap. I'm crying. Yeah. And then it says, et cetera. And et cetera in this book has been defined to mean this pattern continues indefinitely. So I just think the ultimate message of the book is everyone's life is finding out how hollow life is and then wishing you could be young again because now you know. Yeah. And you could do better, but you don't get to. Now I got to go because I'm no, crying. No, that's amazing. <laughs> well, it's probably worth bringing in some of his life context when he was writing this too because he, mm -hmm. in the years before 1973, he went through a couple personal crises in a row. His son, Mark, had a nervous breakdown. And in his letters, he writes about how it is weirdly fine after the nervous breakdown because the science has realized that all Mark needs to deal with his schizophrenia is high doses of vitamins. Yeah. And like that will counteract and work on it. And so very presently and tangibly in his life, he saw like, oh, people are chemicals. This is just something that can be worked on. And he's on. clearly amazed by that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all he, the way back to Mother Night, the revolution of like pills that now affect your mood is insane to him. Yeah. yeah. And so also in 72, a psychiatrist puts Kurt on some antidepressants. And he, he mentions in the book that, oh, I that take a takes, pill to feel yeah. better sometimes. That's the thing. And then also his marriage to Jane Cox fell apart, Jane Cox Monaghan. And then he was working on the play Happy Birthday Wanted June in New York. So he was also kind of floating between apartments in New York and felt like he was very untethered to anything. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of crises and also things that match characters in the book that are happening in his real life. And he is overall trying to roll with it and feel good about it. There's also... And I highly recommend it. It's edited by Dan Wakefield. It's called Kurt Vonnegut Letters. It's a collection of all his letters. And there's one in November 1971 to his daughter, Nanette, where he says that, I feel as though I've lost the years since Slaughterhouse-Five was published, but that's malarkey. Those years weren't lost. They simply weren't the way I'd planned them. Those years were adventures. Planned years are not. And then talks about how, yeah, when Mark had his breakdown, uh. that was not planned. It was, But it's uh, an adventure. It's what's going on. And, sure. You know, and so I feel like maybe this book I'll feel is... that way when I'm 50. There are a good 12 years of my life that uh, my young life that I'm like, that was a fucking black hole waste of time. Oh. <laughs> but maybe I'll gain that perspective. <laughs> maybe I'll be like, it was just an adventure later. We'll see. <laughs> Give me another 10 years. We'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah, and because also, as he says in the book, he turns 50 in the process of writing this book. Mm -hmm. And so he and also had to like kind of stop and start over on this book quite a bit. And so I think there was a lot of reckoning with whether time was wasted in the process yeah. of writing this and in his whole life. Yeah. As uh Karabikian says, sort of one of the, or the big like spiritual wisdom, which we've touched on, but I have the word for word here. Our awareness is all that is alive and may be sacred in any of us. Maybe note the maybe mm -hmm. everything else about us is dead machinery. And uh, what I actually want to bring up is again, just these tangents are so amazing, but this is my favorite one that made my mind explode the most this time was that's the tangent where he talks about he says oh and they were drinking alcohol everyone was alcohol is made by these little creatures called yeast eating and shitting until they suffocate on their own shit and yeah. then he says uh trout once wrote a short story about yeast they were two really smart yeast who were like trying to figure out a, a you know a unified philosophical theory for their whole existence. Due to their limited intelligence, yeah. they never realized that they were shitting alcohol until they <laughs> choked to death. And what they or they never they never guessed that they were making champagne is actually what it says. Yeah. And champagne is great, right? It's like the classy booze. So I just thought that tangent really keyed me in to be like, oh, even though Rabo Karabikian, and this resolved a thing that I couldn't that couldn't stand, an inconsistency that couldn't stand for me. Rabo Karabikian, the bullshit artist, says the most wise line in the thing, but I still am bothered that he's charging 50 grand for that wisdom. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I don't right. like the profit motive. So how can this be true? What is Kurt trying to tell me? Well, I think that's why the tangent of the yeast drowning in their own shit to make champagne exists. Artists can be fucking pretentious as hell and full of themselves and only in it for the money. But if they practice their art, they can still occasionally produce a piece of artwork that encapsulates the wisdom that is their job to present. Right. It doesn't detract from the, like, so Rabo Karabikin can say that amazing thing. And he's still full of shit for charging 50 grand for that painting. And I right. believe both of those things. And yeah. I think Kurt does too because of the shit and the champagne. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he openly says he doesn't like Rabo Karabikian at all. Right, exactly. Well, oh, but person. he does say that statement's true and 
was totally needed at that time in my life and totally refreshed me. God yeah. bless you, Rabo Karabikian. Yeah, it's great. So he's like, you can get a really important message from some asshole. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I lied about the length of my meat. It's mostly in the fourth dimension. <laughs> That's all the mind blowing shit to me, and just the yeah, the yeah, the so. et cetera really destroyed me. Because I'm getting older myself, and I still vainly look for someone who has figured it out before me and tells me it's going to be all okay. And the people who I always find to be the smartest and most wise always end up saying, nope, I was really confused and scared all the way up to the end. And I'm like, God damn it, George Carlin well, and Kurt Vonnegut, don't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, because that, that's another lens you can primarily read this book through is people hunting for parents and hunting for truth. Like yes. that, that is also a dominant thing throughout it and in a lot of books too but it but yeah or even and even wayne looking for Dwayne. And, you know, there's a we talked about how uh, they say every great novel is about someone searching for a father and he's like i agree with him by the way i think it's just yeah. sexism that they said father as the default but he's like i think most people are searching for a mother a mother is much more <laughs> useful and comforting than a father although i actually I've, he's a dude writing as a dude and i'm a dude thinking as a dude i would love to know if females find their father to be the primary emotional support connection. Because yeah, every dude I, I know is all about their mom. Yeah, my take on that bit was <laughs> my take on that bit was that the limited perspective was in Kurt thinking that most people are actually looking for mothers, because I would assume that some women are actually looking for a father and he just thinks they're all everybody's looking for mothers because sure. they're all him. You know? And I'm sure there's of of course many exceptions where yeah. either parent was the more nurturing, whatever, because of the circumstances. Yeah. But yeah. I'm always looking for a mom. <laughs> <laughs> Not no. in a creepy way. Right, right. <laughs> that's what and he says, he's like, that's a creepy thing to or he doesn't say that, but he's like it sounds embarrassing, but it shouldn't be embarrassing. It's true. We're all looking for a mom. <laughs> yeah, it would He's be like, great. I don't mean yeah. it like I want a boner. I just <laughs> want her to comfort Just comfort, me. right? Yeah. He means fairy and guidance and Mom, yeah. to me, and I think a lot of people, probably dudes especially, yeah, mom is fairyland. Your memories of your mother is the time when there was an adult who was your guardian angel and everything was in their control and fine. Yeah. yeah. Like you didn't understand that there were tragedies that could befall you that your mom could not protect you from yet. Right, yeah. And I think we can go into that next segment of Kurt Von Grades. School, the class is Kurt. The grades are ours. And not his, but also his. As we've said in most episodes of the show, Kurt Vonnegut wrote a book called Palm Sunday, where he retroactively graded a lot of his works relative to himself. And uh, Breakfast of Champions is in that set. He gave this book a C. And that's the same grade that he gave two other collections, Wampers, Fomas, and Granfaloons, and also Palm Sunday, the book he did the grading in. He only gave a lower grade to Slapstick, which he gave a D. But otherwise, he gave pretty much every book he wrote before this. Oh, he gave Happy Birthday, Wanda, June a D. But every other novel he wrote besides Slapstick, he gave a higher grade to, which is pretty astounding to me, because on rereading this, it's maybe his best book it's yeah really maybe great. <laughs> maybe it's just really was a depressing exercise for him so i don't know yeah the grades are very skewed i think it's funny as a bit in his book but i don't know how you could objectively grade your own work it's really right. not a possible thing yeah i believe i said sirens was a plus plus so now i have to yes. slide my scale down i give this the infinity symbol and a gold star <laughs> and kurt gets to see me after class and some creepy shit's going to go down <laughs> to show my appreciation. Uh, this is my new favorite Kurt Vonnegut book. Yeah, I think I think Up until I, we read one I haven't read and I change my mind. This is the one for me for now. Well, I, yeah, I, w I think I would, I, Randy, I would give this at least an A++, which is what I gave Cat's Cradle. <laughs> yeah. And it is also the kind of happy surprise I was hoping for, among other things, in doing this show. This is because, the most exciting like, moment for me of this podcasting process so far. Yeah, yeah it was like, Oh, shit. Like, I knew it would oh, happen no. eventually that I'd yeah. read one that I didn't understand before, and this is the one. Yeah. That's so cool it was the same one. <laughs> and, and also, you many folks who have been like, Breakfast of Champions is my favorite. Do that one. I get it now. Yep. Oh, yeah. I understand where you're coming from. I thought from. all the weird tangents Holy were cow. just fun, weird tangents. So I was like, whatever, you guys. The structure's too loose. That's not, it can't be his best one. Yeah, yeah, I think it's his best one. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> But I yeah. haven't read. There's a key ones I haven't read. So there are a couple for me too. My yeah. point: the tension so we'll has see. not completely left the podcast. Yeah, Keep yeah. listening. <laughs> the story is still going. Yeah, and also I was struck by how much this felt like an evolution of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. Like it's it's yeah. a lot of what's in that, but just so much more 
effectively and perfectly done. Yeah. Yeah. Those are our graded. very, very high Ivana grades. So great. You were wrong, Kurt. And then uh, we've done related reading already. We can do a next segment before we start wrapping up called Movie Time. It's Ooh. time for movie time already. Yes, film going through a camera. Time. Film going through a camera. Film going through a camera. What an automatopist you are. <laughs> or just literally describe a thing. <laughs> Uh, Closer, right? <laughs> this uh, this book has a film adaptation made in 1999 yeah, called shit. Breakfast of Champions. <laughs> like, I try not to be hateful toward movies, and I think my feelings are partly driven toward how much I'm into the book, but th- it's one of the worst movies I've ever seen. I completely agree, only because of the last 20 minutes. So, before yeah. the last 20 minutes, I thought it was actually critics were too hard on it, and it still has a lot of good in it that I didn't expect it to have. For example, Mm. and you can disagree with me, I know you do at least in one case, I thought there was phenomenal acting across the board. I've never seen Nick Nolte have more range or be more amusing. Bruce Willis obviously wanted to do the role to prove that he could play someone with deep emotions, and he did do better than I expected him to do. Yeah, I think the cast mostly did a pretty good job, but Albert Finney was really, really wrong for Playboy Trout. Loved Albert Finney. I thought nah. he was the best fit of anyone. No. And the arts festival, it's for an arts festival scene, was hilarious. No. Nah. No. Okay. Well, they it all might, act cartoonish, yeah. which was clearly they were directed to, you can tell. Yeah. So if you don't like the over like, the top acting, you won't like the acting either. I'm just saying it looked hard. Some of the stuff they did looked hard well, acting wise. Because I, I also, I think I would give the movie some credit in the sense that I don't think this book would make a good movie. <laughs> Just in general? Yes. So, uh, yeah. Because, like, the movie, a lot of the time, to me, felt like a headache, you know, and felt like very, it was just very agitated and very difficult to sit through. And I think that's true to the book, because it's about yes. a guy having a nervous breakdown and another guy who, who's yeah. incredibly unhappy and a third guy who's the author and might kill himself. And mm-hmm. so that should not be comfortable to watch. But you need to really, really nail the book for that discomfort to be worth it. And right. But the other side of that is I don't know how you can say you liked it or anything nice about it when the last 20 minutes includes a complete betrayal and shitting yep. upon everything the book is about, completely altering the message until it's the opposite of the message. Yep. Like you don't <laughs> give a shit and just like sh- walking out. So it's hard to say the good things because at the end, the movie drops the ball in such a way that if you have just read the book and it affected you, the movie disgusts you. Yeah. Like that well, they I, would put it out in the world and call themselves fans of the material, content-wise. And then what's funny to me is I looked up on Rotten Tomatoes where it's a huge flop. Not a single reviewer hated it for that reason. They all hate it because really? the acting's too comical or whatever. Oh, that's No one cared shocking. that it's the opposite of what the story was about. And I think that is hilariously exactly what Kurt's talking about in the book. The person who (laughs) fucking directed this movie just liked the way this book sounded. Yeah. They do not understand what the book is about. Or even worse, they chose to not care and change what the book is about. But I feel more like the movie itself is an artifact of what Kurt's talking about, where most art is just bullshit, (laughs) including, unfortunately, (laughs) this movie of his work, which he appears in. He appears in He does a Stanley cameo, giving it the implicit sign-off. Yeah, around the (laughs) 24-minute mark, he's the director of a TV commercial that they're shooting in front of the dealership. And so then, then I was like... Oh, so he approves it? But in hindsight, I think he just likes being in stuff. We've seen time and again. (laughs) Kurt Vonnegut was totally like, also, he didn't think it cheapened the book for you to make a movie, even if you fucked it up. No. He seemed like he was like, oh, cool. Yeah, sure. Make a movie. I'd love to see what you do with it. Like, he didn't care if it was bad. He would just be like, well, you could still read the book. Well, even because in my collection of letters, he, in 1988, writes a letter to Jack Nicholson asking him to be Dwayne Hoover because he needs he to be Dwayne be Hoover great. in the movie. Wow. And throughout his life, he seems very on board with Hollywood adapting his work. Like, yeah. he's not an he Alan Moore type cool. where he's yeah. going to rage against it. He And he remained very happy about the Slaughterhouse-Five movie and I think also the Mother Night movie. But this movie super doesn't work and yeah. and also and it super betrays him at the end but i also think it betrays him at least a little at the beginning like a couple minutes in 
there's a housekeeper with large literal breakfast calling upstairs and saying breakfast of champions breakfast of champions right. which is not what Changes that means the meaning it just makes it mundane and true yeah yeah also celia hoover is alive i was gonna the say movie. am i wrong or did his <laughs> wife come back to life for the movie right yeah. so like i initially was with like okay so they're gonna show she's a ghost or something what happens no she's super alive throughout and they have a nice reunion at the end they play the oh yeah the ending <laughs> i can't even get there yet First, I just want to say, they play the hairy transvestite thing mostly for sitcom comedy. Yeah. Like, they super heighten and add additional lines. And in fact, instead of Harry being destroyed in a real way, he's, like, comically upset, like a sitcom who's yeah. been caught. Like, Whoa. And they go way more into, like, oh, he accidentally says something that's a double entendre for being a transvestite. And it even yeah. gets to the point where Dwayne explicitly finds out he's a transvestite, which right. never happens which in never the book. Yeah. And they actually discuss transvestitism in a weird way that didn't need to happen. Yeah. I think Bunny lives in, like, a bunker in, in his yard or something. Bunny plays, for some reason. Is like, lives in a nice neighborhood and plays yeah. synthesizer. Like, they're trying to update it but it doesn't work bunny is completely comically gay like in a yeah. way that i would say is played for laughs mostly yeah are you trying to speed it up? no I, I just feel like we can jump to the ending of the movie because no. it's pretty dynamic I, I watched this piece of crap <laughs> yeah me too wayne hubler who i already think kurt somewhat shortchanged and i know part of the issue is black people are shortchanged in society that's the point but i also think he's yeah. still shortchanged the character anyway yeah Wayne Hubler is even more shortchanged here. He says Fairyland out loud. Right. He's a fucking cartoon character. By far the wackiest performance. His plight, quote unquote, of living as a homeless person is portrayed as him comically MacGyvering together stuff so that like garbage can make a shower. Yeah. It's literally like a Home Alone comedy for this black dude who just got out of prison. You're like, what the fuck are you trying to say? <laughs> and then he's like comically, yeah, sees Fairyland and literally collapses with joy on the hood of a car. Yeah. It's fucking bizarre. Again, I thought Wayne Hubler was misused. You're making this movie many years later. You changed a bunch of shit. You could have changed that. You could have yeah. made, you had every opportunity to make Wayne Hubler better. Yeah. And you made him worse. Yeah. One good thing. <laughs> Owen Wilson appears in the background on TV. And I thought he was delightful. And he's in a scene. And they also make uh, the character he's with in the scene, Buck Henry, who's like a very famous humorist yeah. and exciting guy. Owen so like Wilson it's exciting that they're Henry, in the yeah. movie, but they're completely wasted. They're just like on TV for a bit and not good. I wrote Finney great as always, but you don't agree. I think I'm so driven in my head to have Kilgore Trout be a thin and much less powerful person and yeah. presence and it, and and finney just seems like way too grounded and solid and it might huh. be because i love him in uh, miller's crossing and he's oh, the opposite God, in that yeah, but so I, I think he's kind of doing that performance here and it really doesn't sure. work yeah i'll buy that in the book they use the plot device of francine pefko just suddenly thinking why don't you go to the arts festival Dwayne, to get him to the art festival yeah. in the movie they change that to i shit you not an ad for the arts festival comes on TV coincidentally at the time that Dwayne is reaching his nadir. Right. And he's like, oh, TV is the answer. Fucking what a hacky plot thing to add. Okay. Elliot Rosewater. <laughs> Think about how you imagine Elliot Rosewater having read God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. Okay. Yeah, right. Hold that in your mind. In this, Elliot Rosewater is a bald, weasel-faced, high-voiced morbidly obese dude wearing a velvet cape with yeah. gold spectacles right. he's a fucking nut yeah. like, and i don't mean in the compelling way that he was in the novel right. he's like a goofball comic book guy if he was crazy or something right he's like a total joke that you just write off yeah and and underused and used wrongly and and it doesn't make any sense <laughs> all right all right okay here we are here we are okay the ending yeah let's begin the shitting on the ending alex what's yeah. wrong with the ending <laughs> And also we're saying with Francine, by making Celia alive, Dwayne is cheating on her with Francine. Like yes. in the actual book, both Dwayne and Francine had spouses die, became widows, and then got together, which is totally different. Whole yes. other meaning there. Anyway. So the, the changes end, continue from there. <laughs> in the ending, they all meet in the bar, like in the book. And then as Trout and Dwayne connect, Trout starts to say a bunch of really nice and positive things to Dwayne, which he interprets because of his blurred vision as being like positive oh news from God. the creator, yes. which is a complete flip of everything the book means and intends. Yeah, get this. Okay, first of all, Trout says, and this becomes the message of the movie, and you're supposed to believe it, because yeah. keep in mind, this version ends with 
Dwayne Hoover being redeemed and reconnecting with his wife and living happily ever after. Yeah. I shit you not. So Trout tells him things like, if you knew the answer, there'd be no more questions. And Bruce Willis goes, oh, I'm not crazy anymore. Like the hackiest, most hallmark shit. Right. You ripped the last 10 pages out of the book and you just wrote in the most bland shit. He said, until you're dead, it's all life. You just have to make the most of it. And Bruce Willis runs out going, it's all life. It's all life. Right. And they play the happy violins <laughs> like he's cured of his insanity. Yeah. They invent a manager for Bunny so that he can punch the manager in the jaw instead of brutally attacking his own son. Yeah, although I think he hurts Bunny some too. But not Very nearly mildly as badly as in the to book. Ma they make yeah. it, that's the other point is they make everything over the top except... The, the rampage, that, right. which they completely defang. Yeah. The book clearly cries out for a narrator. Like right. the narrator's the main character in the book. When Kurt's not Kurt in Kurt Vonnegut the movie. does not appear in the movie. Right. They removed him as a character. They remove his narration entirely. And yet, in the last eight minutes of their movie, there is one and only one piece of narration. So keep in mind, this is a movie based on a book with tons of narration. And they thought... No, we shouldn't use narration. Oh, but this point's so important. We do need to use narration here. And the narration is fucking Bruce Willis saying how he's redeemed and not crazy now because of the shit that happened this night and that he's going to make the most of his life from now on. Fuck you. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, my God, you ruined everything. Yeah. It's like as insulting as it could be to the meaning of the book. And also, and then Dwayne walks through Sugar Creek and gets the pollution on his legs in order to reconnect with Celia, who is dead the whole book, and then also reconnect with Bunny, who makes a point of saying, no, you didn't dig me up that bad. It's fine. We're all great. And so, like, their the nuclear becomes, family oh, again. Oh, the white nuclear family is right. saved. Are you happy? And then Trout... <laughs> that was so not the point. <laughs> and, then, and then Kilgore Trout walks into a poster of Hawaii... With a Fuck. little girl who leads him off into the sunset wait. happily. Oh, shit. And then we just pan over the dealership and the movie's no, over. No, wait. That, there's more. You're right. Okay. Make me young, make me young Not, is like the most tragic. The whole point of the book, at least in my mind, is that yeah. that is tragic that he would want that. Yeah. In the movie, Trout's happy ending is that he teleports to fairyland, asks a little fairy to make him young, and she does. Yeah. He lives happily ever after as a baby spirit in paradise. It's just... Oh, fuck this awful. movie. Yeah. It's bad. We've savaged it. And yet worth well, watching. We... I was like, entertain. If I you can watch so. it and not believe any of the messages, I think it's fun to watch. I wish everyone involved in it well. It's it's awful. Don't watch it. Okay. <laughs> I liked how the opening credits used the doodles well. The doodles are throughout that? the movie. Yeah. But they use them yeah. really cleverly, if you notice. Like, it would say, like, director of photography, and it would show the glasses doodle. The, and it would be, like, set design, and it would, or costume design, it would show the tuxedo doodle. Yeah. I feel like the credits did it better than the rest of the movie did. The rest oh, of the movie, they just show up on, the like, walls and The highlight of the movie is the opening credits. Yeah. Yeah, the credits are all right. Should we get into how we'd make it, or just skip it? Because I, I do... I'm I don't, spent. I don't have a cast, but I'd love to hear yours if you have some in mind. Like, I'd I love have, to hear who you would cast as Trout. Because I only have two big thoughts on how to make it. The third extra one is don't make it. It works better as a book. Totally. But I think director-wise, the instinct with this book would be to pick somebody very cartoony, very slapsticky, very good at Looney Tunes type action. And I think you would want to... I would go opposite. I would pick someone who's like very clinical and very detached and so especially, like, I feel like that rampage that Dwayne does would just be one wide, you know, so it really oh, hits, yeah. you know, something like that. Uh, so somebody, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> All my, green grass? my crazy thought was Malik. You oh, just, you just, so you get a lot of landscapes oh, yeah. and, and you see all these towns and, you know, yeah, right. you really give it, you make it feel weighty. You know? He would at least take a whack at like the psychedelic aspect. Right. Like the movie seen, whittled it down to just the very mundane narrative that unfolds. Yeah. Yeah. I want like his movie, The Tree of Life, but for this right. book, like if yeah, you're going to do that'd it. That'd be cool. And then my only casting thought was, and also kind of crazy, but you make Dwayne and Trout and Vonnegut all the same actor. Like just one actor plays all of them because they're all they're all created by the creator. So they're all in the creator's image and it's all. Uh, and you already know who it would be. I really like that Nicholson idea, even though it kind of goes against my complaint about Albert Finney. But if not him, then someone thin and virtuosic. Hal Holbrook. Chris yeah, Cooper. something like that. <laughs> I mean, I've always liked John Hawks for Trout, just because I think it's a physical you love fit. John Hawks, uh, but also age-wise and everything, I think he'd be good as all of them. Yeah, I think he could do it. I don't think he'd be a good Dwight. 
or Dwayne. Dwayne. Yeah. I think, and maybe I'm. Yeah, he I don't might know. not be. I think he Dwayne does need to be built like a Bruce Willis, like a chubby. Yeah. I mean, in the Nichol- movie, Nicholson's I know a good Bruce pick. Willis can look strong mm-hmm. when he has to for other movies, but yeah, he's yeah. like a bald, schlubby, broad dude. Yeah. In my mind and in the movie, and I think I think that was right. That should stay that way. Yeah. Because he's supposed Willis to be like your Nicholson classic fits. smiling car used car salesman, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it it fits to me. That makes sense. But yeah, those are my only thoughts on Farley it. Farley really... and Spade, dude. Farley and Spade. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking, but no. Farley is Trout. Spade is Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob Lowe is Dwayne. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we can go straight into a segment called Vonnegut News. Toast is ready. More at 11. More, ooh, more toast. More toast. Yummy. Yeah, night. Working on my night toast. Uh, <laughs> Is that something I should know? <laughs> this, oh, it's sort of like night cheese from Thirty Rock. But oh, gotcha. Not really. There's uh, a bit of Vonnegut news about the world, and for you, two theatrical things. There's going to be a production of Mother Night in the city of San Francisco in May and June. If you look up, it's a company called the Custom Made Theater Company, and they're doing Mother Night as a play. And it's supposed to start uh, May 25th is opening night. So if you're in the Bay Area, check that out. And if you're in City of Angels, Los Angeles, there's a company called Sacred Fools doing a play of Sirens of Titan that we are going to go check out at some point. And then here's uh, some news you can use. For one thing, we are working with a study at Duke University that you can participate in as a big, big fan of Kurt Vonnegut. And they're also doing a, a raffle of prizes for people who participate it's a, a study through Duke. They want to find out how the brains of Vonnegut readers remember Vonnegut's work. And study participants have the chance to win a copy of the Vonnegut Encyclopedia by Mark Leeds, or some enamel pins of Kurt, or a Kurt Vonnegut's poster with art by our Vonna friend Hunter Sanders, signed by Michael and I. Uh, so if you want to participate in an online study to help science and maybe win some prizes, go to tinyurl.com slash science guys. And we'll have a link to that in the description on everywhere we put this. I was not approached about this, so we'll see if my signature's on there. I didn't promise any oh, such thing. I thought we talked about the signature. Hey, maybe I'll sign it. Maybe I won't. Oh, no. We'll see. Oh, no. You're hey, abandoning maybe, me maybe in my you, hour of need. Maybe you did tell me and I just forgot. Still, <laughs> I do what I want. I sign what I want. He's a loose cannon. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how to write. That's I'm hiding my embarrassment. <laughs> right, you've just been reading these books like pantomime, yeah, like exactly. yes. Yeah. I just make my mark, just a big X. <laughs> but yeah, that's tinyurl.com slash science guys, and it should be fun if you're a fan of the show and a fan of Kurt in general. And then the other news you can use is that May 31st in Los Angeles, we are doing the first ever live episode of Kurt Vonnegut's. It's going to be 7.30 p.m. May 31st at The Last Bookstore, which is an amazing bookstore in downtown L.A. That's going to be a live episode for Palm Sunday, which is kind of Kurt's secret autobiography, an amazing piece of work. And we're going to talk about it live. It's going to be a free event, so just come on down, and there will be more info about it on our social media and on Cracked social media leading up to it. Open bar, full food, uh, buffet, ooh. totally free. All ooh. proceeds go to you. Ooh. Raffling off some iTunes <laughs> gift cards. <laughs> Could have thought back. of any prize. Any prize in the sure. world. No, no, no. <laughs> More like goodbye, new fun day. It's going to be a fun day. Come on out. <laughs> Bring the kids. Yeah, really do please come. Yeah. It'll be great. And we're really excited about doing it. And uh, yes, especially bring children. No, no, that's great. God damn it, don't end on that. <laughs> Bring your keys. Uh, we won't. We won't end on that. Uh, our next episode is going to be about Juan Peter Sfoma and Grand Faloons, which was an uh, essay collection and other things collection by Kurt. And then after that, the next episode will be about his novel Slapstick. Uh, so a couple exciting books coming up after this one. That's Slapstick. Not slaps dick. I was searching uh, on the internet and I found uh, some weird shit. So yeah. I'll roll a clip. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sound effect. Brad can just pipe in there. Yeah, it mean, probably just. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, and I don't know. I've really enjoyed this episode and especially this book and especially your company, Michael. It's been great. If this isn't nice, what is? Nothing. Especially that part in the movie where they butcher that line. Oh, it's the word. <laughs> yeah. They even throw in. It's oh, yeah. I Let's go talk. We forever. gotta talk off air about how um, this movie sucked. You've been wonderful. We'll see you at Juan Peter's Foam and Grand Falloons, and thanks for listening. Bye. I mean, it was garbage, right? It was terrible. <laughs> the worst. I could, the worst. It. Ruined film. <laughs>